Hello historians and welcome back to another episode. Today we are going to be exploring the early life of the most notorious monarch in English history. Known for going through wives like money, the monarch we are exploring today is King Henry VIII. However, during the time we're exploring today, he would not have been King Henry VIII. He would have been Henry Tudor, Duke of York, or slash eventually, the Prince of Wales. Henry Tudor Jr, as I like to call him, was born at Greenwich Palace on the 28th of June 1491 to King Henry VII and his wife and queen, Elizabeth of York. Henry was the couple's third surviving child, with an older brother Arthur, Prince of Wales, born in 1487, and an older sister Margaret, born in 89. Henry was considered relatively unimportant compared to his brother Arthur during his early years, as it was expected that Arthur would be gone to become king, and as a result, Henry spent his childhood with his sisters and mother. If you look at Henry VIII's handwriting, it is very similar to that of his mother Elizabeth, and his younger sister Mary. This suggests that Elizabeth may have taught them to write, and we can presume that they had a close bond, one that may not have existed between Henry and his father. As the spare to the throne, Henry's education included music, languages, poetry and sports subjects that would not best prepare him for kingship. These lessons were reserved and offered to his brother Arthur instead. Thanks to his grandmother, Lady Margaret Beaufort, Henry Duke of York had a passion for learning and was the most educated king to have ascended the English throne so far. He could speak and write fluent French and Latin, he could understand Italian, and thanks to his first wife Catherine of Aragon, by 1520, he could converse in Spanish, which quite frankly is more than what she could do. By the end of 1507, bear in mind she'd been in the country for just under a decade, she still couldn't speak English. Lazy. Henry loved reading, but he started to suffer with recurring headaches and migraines in 1519, and as a result, he found reading and writing somewhat tedious and painful. He also had a talent for maths and a love for astronomy, something that he shared with Sir Thomas More. On the 9th of November 1501, Henry, Duke of York, met his future sister-in-law slash wife at Deptford. Edward Stafford, the Duke of Buckingham, and the Duke of York welcomed Catherine as she arrived and they conducted her to her lodging at Lambeth Palace. Later that month, on the 14th of November, Catherine of Aragon wed Henry's older brother Arthur, Prince of Wales, at St Paul's Cathedral. The Prince and Princess of Wales rode off to Baynard's Castle, where the wedding banquet took place in the Great Hall. Catherine, rather stately and elegantly, was clicking her castanets, while Henry, as a true Englishman, whipped off his gown and whirled his sister Margaret across the floor, leaping and twirling to the music. This supports what we know about Henry in later life with his love of music and dancing. Now, it might have been down to his age, or the fact that he was second in line to the throne, but Henry Duke of York was not well known to the people. I mean, they knew he existed, but he kept out of the limelight for much of his life. All of this privacy, though, would come to an end when Henry's brother Arthur died on the 2nd of April 1502. His brother's death changed everything for Henry. Henry was now heir to the throne, and his education took a swift turn, as he was now being trained for kingship. He was expected to attend more public engagements, so the public could actually recognise him, and his father became increasingly overprotective of his son. The Duke of York would experience more pain on the 11th of February 1503, when his mother Elizabeth died from childbirth complications, trying to provide another heir to the throne. As established earlier, Henry Tudor had a close bond with his mother, so it's understandable that the 12-year-old prince would have been heartbroken at his mother's death. The possibility of another heir to the Tudor throne died with Elizabeth. Henry VII had one son left, and as a result, was prepared to protect him at all costs. Henry, Duke of York, was not allowed to leave his room, except for exercise. On the 25th of June, Henry, Duke of York, and Catherine of Aragon, so his brother's widow, were formally betrothed and they were given papal dispensation in the December on the condition 
that Catherine had not consummated her marriage with Arthur. That's a debate for another day. Anyway, back to her husband. The end of 1503 onwards must have been a very lonely experience for Henry, being held prisoner in his own room, losing both his mother and brother within 12 months. His sister Margaret then decides to go to Scotland in August 1503, I mean, it's not really her decision, it's more like her father arranged the marriage for her, so she had to go. But this only leaves Henry with his younger sister, Mary, and their father, who Henry did not have the best relationship with. This might explain why Henry had been drawn to his sister and Catherine of Aragon. Henry and Catherine were not permitted to spend regular time with each other, as his father strived to keep them apart. This also may explain why in later life Henry specified that the line of succession should go through his sister Mary and writing Margaret and her descendants out of the line of succession. The three of them could have found solace in each other. When I say three, I mean Mary, Henry and Catherine. When they were permitted with each other's company, as they had all lost a mother, Elizabeth had also been a mother figure to Catherine, a brother or a husband. On the 18th of February 1504, Henry, Duke of York, is formally created the Prince of Wales. I will be now referring to him as such until he is king. On the 26th of November 1504, Catherine's mother, Isabella of Castile, died, literally devaluing Catherine overnight. King Henry VII was now less keen for his son, the Prince of Wales, to marry this minor princess as she was not the powerful infanta she once was. And, as a result, the night before the Prince of Wales' 14th birthday, King Henry VII made his son renounce his vows in front of the Bishop of Winchester, on the grounds that he was too young to make such an important decision. The secret meeting with the Bishop was to allow Henry to break off the engagement, if a better match came around for his son, but also keep the engagement going as a backup. So... What it's saying here is that Henry VII wanted his cake, and he wanted to eat it. But he didn't necessarily have said cake. Poor Catherine, I mean, she was none the wiser. Nor did she know that when her sister and brother-in-law, Queen Juana of Aragon and Castile and Philip the Handsome, arrived in England in 1506, that they were actually discussing replacing Catherine as the future bride for the Prince of Wales with their own daughter, and Catherine's niece, Eleanor. Philip the Handsome died in the September of 1506, and that was the last of the marriage negotiations. As a result, King Henry VII allowed Catherine and the Prince of Wales to spend quality time with each other from the late summer to the autumn of 1506. It was around this time that Juana's father, Ferdinand, became ruler of Castile and Aragon again, and therefore Catherine was now seen in a more favourable light. The two bonded and the Prince of Wales never hinted at this secret rejection of his betrothal, still referring to Catherine as my most dear and well-beloved consort, the princess of my wife. The king, noticing their closeness, didn't approve of it as he was trying to arrange a better match for his son, so he sent Catherine away to live at Fulham Palace. The Prince of Wales would see Catherine again intermittently as she was present for the tournaments that were held to celebrate the Prince of Wales' 16th birthday in 1507. During this time, King Henry VII had strived to stabilise a country that had been in civil war, and also to try and secure his own dynasty, and he had succeeded in strengthening the crown both financially and in its ability to do justice. Although all of this would come to an end on the 21st of April 1509, when King Henry VII died. Henry was notorious for undoing his father's work, both financially and politically. Henry VIII liked having parties and he liked spending money. On his deathbed, King Henry VII admitted to his son that he was concerned about how poorly he had treated Catherine and commanded his son to do the honourable thing and marry her. This may have been due to his fear over the lack of succession, and not solely guilt. Although the Prince of Wales had renounced his vows, that had been done in secret, only the bishop and the two Henrys were privy to that information. And now, 
one of them was going to take that information to his grave. And remarkably, they couldn't find the bishop. The new King Henry VIII was hesitant at first. Catherine was his brother's widow, and in Tudor times, that would have been viewed as his sister. However, Ferdinand promised Henry VIII a full dowry upon consummation, and reassured Henry that the Pope had given a dispensation. He then gave the example of the King of Portugal, who had married two of Catherine's sisters in succession, and was blessed with numerous offspring. It was now Ferdinand who wanted an alliance between England and Spain, and told his daughter that he loved her, the most of his children, and looks on the King of England like a son. As sweet as that sounds, it's not really saying much when three of your five children are dead, and the other surviving child you personally had in prison due to mental illness so you could usurp her throne. Henry, Prince of Wales, became King Henry VIII upon his father's death at the age of 17. He had been with his father in his bedchambers when he had died, and the public were informed of the former king's death two days later. The new king met with the Privy Council in early June, and they urged him to marry the Princess Catherine and fulfil the treaty. Henry VIII agreed that there were many good reasons for the marriage, but above all, he told them, he desired her above all women, he loved her and longed to wed her. The couple wed days later on the 11th of June, 1509, and later that month, the newlyweds had a joint coronation on the 23rd of June. Henry VIII sat in King Edward I's coronation chair and received the crown of St Edward the Confessor. Within the first few days of his reign, King Henry VIII released a general pardon for the country of anyone who might have been in trouble under his father's reign. Henry's basically smearing his father's rule and using his father's unpopularity to boost his own and gain the support of the people. This pardon, no surprise, was well received by the Tudor public. In doing so, he is sending a message to his subjects that he knew people had suffered under his father's reign and he will do what he can to right those wrongs, trying to paint a picture of him being the greatest king in history. It's easy to see why some historians view Henry VIII and Catherine of Aragon's marriage as a love match, over an arranged match, of which I kind of believe it's both. I'm more on the belief that Henry did have general fondness for his first wife, but I also believe the marriage was done out of convenience. I mean, she was already there, it was a good match, it was easy. But what do you think? As a young man, which he was during the beginning of his reign, King Henry VIII was considered to be quite the catch. Apart from being King of England, obviously, he was said to be quite attractive, athletic, funny, and this is the bit that shocked me, a pleasant person to be around, as he loved music, dancing, and was a very far cry from the fat, aging king that history often portrays. As we discussed last episode, in early June 1509, Henry VIII was urged by his Privy Council to marry Catherine of Aragon and fulfil the treaty between England and Spain. It was also noted that after the discussion with the Privy Council, Henry gleefully made his way to Catherine's apartment. The joyous king dismissed her attendants and declared his love for her, asking for her hand, to which, by all accounts, Catherine accepted with the greatest happiness. I can't say I blame her after what she'd been through since Prince Arthur's death. Henry had to seek special permission from the Pope to marry Catherine, as she had previously been married to Henry's elder brother, Arthur. In Tudor times, Catherine would have been seen as Henry's sister, and the marriage would have been considered incestuous had her and Arthur consummated the marriage. Historians still debate whether Arthur and Catherine had consummated their marriage, despite Catherine saying she didn't. The Pope agreed to give them the dispensation on the grounds that Catherine's first marriage had not been consummated, although bits would be edited as time went on. Catherine and Henry wed on the 11th of June 1509 and had a joint coronation later that year on the 23rd of June at Westminster Abbey. In the early stages of his reign, Henry would rely heavily on Catherine for her advice and counsel. He would say, The Queen must hear of this, or... This will please the Queen. 
I believe that Catherine quite enjoyed this advisory role, as she would have seen it as her fulfilling her role given by God to support her husband. However, Henry would fail to realise that Catherine's father, Ferdinand, would be influencing her daughter and therefore her advice. He was kind of doing this to try and manipulate the English king into his favour. In January 1510, Henry sent a letter ordering the construction of two new ships. These ships were the infamous Mary Rose, named after his sister, and the Mary Rose's sister ship, the Peter Pomegranate, which was a tribute to his wife and queen, Catherine, whose emblem at the time was a pomegranate. Both ships were built in Portsmouth. When Henry and Catherine divorced, the Peter Pomegranate became just Peter. Later that month, on the 31st of January 1510, Catherine gave birth to a stillborn daughter. Although tragic, this was not uncommon for a first pregnancy. Henry did his best to comfort her, but Catherine was depressed for weeks and couldn't shake off the feeling of guilt. Understandable when you have this enormous pressure of producing an heir, and her symbol, her emblem, was the pomegranate, which was symbolic for fertility. Rather ironic in hindsight. Catherine got pregnant again rather quickly, and this did lift her spirits. However, it was at this point that Henry started to stray, and he was certain that this child would live to be a healthy boy. A year later, on the 1st of January 1511, Catherine and Henry welcomed their first son, Henry, Duke of Cornwall, at Richmond Palace. The king could not do enough to honour and praise his queen for delivering the Duke of Cornwall. The long-awaited prince was christened on the 5th of January at Richmond. The celebrations for the birth of the prince lasted for well over a month. However, seven weeks later, on the 22nd of February 1511, the beloved baby Henry, Duke of Cornwall, died. Henry VIII comforted Catherine, but the king made no great mourning outwardly, but spent a lavish sum of money on the funeral. His lack of grieving is an early sign of the king being able to shut off his emotions. In the November, after much scheming on Ferdinand's part, Henry and Ferdinand signed the Treaty of Westminster, whereby Henry and Ferdinand pledged to help each other out against France. By 1512, Ferdinand II of Aragon was at war with France, and on the 30th of June 1513, King Henry VIII appointed a heavily pregnant Catherine regent in England while he went to France on military campaign. The 16th of August 1513 saw the Battle of Spurs, which we don't tend to talk about because we lost and England don't like talking about or wars or battles that we lost, so you didn't hear it from me but we lost that one. As I said, in English history we don't like talking about battles that we lost. Take the counter armada for example. The what? Exactly, moving on. On the 3rd of September of that year, Catherine of Aragon ordered Thomas Lovell to raise an army in the Midland countries in fear of another attack from the Scottish-French alliance. Six days later, with the Battle of Flodden, aka the Battle of Braxton, the English won this one, so we'll talk about this one. Uh, the Battle of Flodden was actually a retaliation for Henry VIII's invasion of France in the May. King Louis the Twelfth of France invokes the terms of the uh, oh can't say this one Allude Alliance or Allude Alliance, a defence alliance between the French and the Scottish to deter the English from invading. King Henry was off fighting the French while pregnant warrior Queen Catherine was left at home to fight the Scottish. The English had planned on the French invoking the alliance, which is why Catherine had rallied troops up north. Thomas Howard, Earl of Surrey who was 70, by the way, had assembled 26,000 men for the fight at Flodden Edge and had asked King James IV of Scotland to fight on flat ground. But the Scottish king and King Henry VIII's brother-in-law, as he had married his sister Margaret, refused. Queen Catherine rode north in full armour to address her troops, despite being heavily pregnant. As the two sides advanced, the Scottish troops started to slip down the hill, which caused them to break their formation and slow down their advances. Despite the Scots having modern weapons, 
the English won this battle with very few casualties. Unfortunately, the same can't be said for the Scots, who lost between ten to 17,000 men. And even worse, their king, King James IV of Scotland, was a casualty of the battle and died. It was thought that Catherine wanted to maim the Scottish king's body and send it back to the Scots as proof of their victory. But even the English found this a bit gruesome. But the TLDR of the Battle of Flodden was that the victory of the warrior Queen Catherine. And yet somehow, somehow, history still gives her husband, the man who wasn't even present, the credit. However, I think all of the excitement must have been a bit too much for the warrior queen, as eight days later, on the 17th of September, 1513, Catherine suffered another stillbirth. On the 22nd of October, 1513, King Henry VIII returned to England with a rather bruised ego. He had to return as it was not wise to campaign during the winter months. Ferdinand had promised to help Henry take the French throne, but it became clear that Ferdinand and the Holy Roman Emperor Maximilian would not support Henry's campaign. And to make matters worse, the Council of Flanders had rejected Henry's marriage proposal for his sister Mary to the Archduke Charles. Henry felt insulted. He felt humiliated as he couldn't get Ferdinand. Henry would take his frustrations out on Ferdinand's daughter and Catherine would ultimately suffer for her father's abandonment and betrayal. The trust that would have been evident at the start of his reign was now beginning to fade, and whether Henry would ever trust the counsel of his wife again was unlikely. 1514, Catherine gives birth to another stillborn, and it is at this point that Henry VIII starts his five-year affair with Elizabeth Bessie Blount. Henry also contracted smallpox, which terrified him. He had a chronic fear of illnesses, which is actually quite understandable, as that's how his brother died. On the 9th of October 1514, Henry married his sister Mary to the nearly dead King Louis XII of France. Three months later, on the 1st of January 1515, Mary's husband, King Louis XII of France, died from exhaustion apparently. Mary then eloped with Henry's bestie, Charles Brandon, Duke of Suffolk. Henry was pretty angry about this, um, but that was okay once they'd paid a big enough fine. Catherine was now starting to age, and she wasn't the beauty she once was. But, to be fair, she had had five pregnancies at this point, and was a fair bit older than her husband. Meanwhile, her youthful husband was blooming into a handsome young man. To compensate for her ageing looks, Catherine would dress herself as magnificently as she could. On the 18th of February, 1516, the royal couple finally welcomed a healthy baby named Mary. Henry VIII had mixed feelings towards his newborn daughter. He was delighted about the birth, claiming that Mary was a right lusty princess and he was very fond in showing her off to visiting dignitaries, and you could see that he was bursting with pride. However, Mary was not the male heir that Henry needed. Catherine, on the other hand, was very maternal and fiercely protective of her pretty child. Catherine's last pregnancy was in 1518. The birth of Mary proved that Catherine was capable of delivering a healthy baby, and Henry made such a fuss of her as he knew at this point a healthy baby was not a guarantee. Unfortunately, this final pregnancy would also result in a stillborn. It became apparent as the Queen aged that Henry may have made a mistake marrying his elder brother's widow, with King Francis I of France going as far to say, My good brother of England has no son, because although young and handsome, he keeps an old and deformed wife. Bit harsh, mate. Henry surprisingly never once reproached Catherine for his lack of a male heir. The same could not be said for his next wife and queen, though. 1519 was not a good year for Catherine, as this was the year that Henry's mistress, Elizabeth Bessie Blount, gave birth to a healthy boy, Henry Fitzroy, named after his father. Although not legitimised, Henry did recognise Fitzroy as his son and gave him several titles, 
as well as an education fit for a prince, as the birth of Fitzroy proved that he was able to father male children, and that, well, Catherine must be the issue. It's not his fault. Catherine was filled with sorrow and humiliation at the news of the birth, and it was at this point Henry started to consider the possibility of being cursed for marrying his brother's widow. Henry and Catherine met their French counterparts at the Field of Cloth of Gold between the 7th and the 24th of June 1520. The event was completely and utterly a farce. It didn't achieve anything, and it was just one king trying to outdo the other. King Henry VIII nearly bankrupted England in the process, and he nearly started a war. Henry had been clean-shaven until around 1518. Kings Henry and Francis agreed that they would grow a beard and not shave it until they met each other at the Field of the Cloth of Gold. Catherine hated her husband's beard, and by November 1519, Henry had given in and shaved it off. However, Francis was enraged when he saw Henry without his beard, as he had broken his promise. Thankfully for Henry, Catherine jumped in and told Francis that she had requested her husband to shave. Luckily, King Francis found it funny that a mighty king could bend the knee to his wife. Fortunately, Queens Catherine and Claude enjoyed each other's company and they bonded over religion, Catholicism in case you were wondering. The Spanish Catherine, England and France were all Catholics at this stage. In 1521, King Henry VIII became the first king of England to write and publish a book, The Defence of the Seven Sacraments. It was a response to Martin Luther's 95 Thesis. In his book, Henry called Luther a venomous serpent, infected soul, pernious plague and an infernal wolf. Some of the biggest slams that you could have actually written in 16th century England. The book was a bestseller and in the autumn, Pope Leo X awarded Henry with the title of Defender of the Faith. In gratitude for defending the Catholic faith, against the horrors of Luther's Lutherism. Basically, he was a Protestant. Queen Elizabeth II, and now King Charles III, hold the title even though Britain has been an independent Protestant state for more than four centuries. 1522 marked the beginning of the end for Catherine of Aragon, as this was the year that the Boleyn sisters, Anne and Mary, came to England to serve the Queen as ladies-in-waiting. It was around this point that the king took Mary Boleyn, yes Mary, as his mistress, and his wife Catherine was going through the menopause, so all sexual relations with Catherine had ceased by 1524. By 1525, Henry was now finished with Mary, and he was now pursuing her sister Anne, who was notorious for refusing to be Henry's mistress whenever he asked which only made the king more determined. 1527 was the year of the Reformation and the king's great matter. Henry had decided that Catherine was no use to him anymore and that he wanted to divorce her for a younger Anne Boleyn, who was promising the foolish king for the male heirs that Catherine couldn't provide him. Henry had asked for an annulment, but he was denied this would eventually lead to England splitting from the Vatican and the Catholic faith and the creation of the Protestant Church of England, which is ultimately how Henry would get his divorce. In early 1527, Henry proposed to Anne Boleyn. She found his passion quite hard to deal with and considering Catherine was already discarded, he flirted with Anne publicly. Understandably, feeling uncomfortable, Anne withdrew from court to her home of Hever Castle. However, Anne hiding at Hever did nothing to quench Henry's thirst for her, and by the late spring, Anne had accepted the king's marriage proposal as soon as he was free to wed. Now, a lot of people kind of see Henry and Anne's relationship as like a, a classic romance love affair. I actually view it as quite the opposite. I just see Henry as like an annoying person being like I love you I love you only you can love me only you can make me feel so happy and I feel like Anne was just a bit like go away and then he didn't go away and then she was like okay well he's not going away 
Wouldn't be too bad, I'd be Queen of England, there's a few benefits. Okay, let's go for it. I mean, obviously, a lot of Anne's responses don't survive. A lot of her letters aren't around. But if you read Henry's letters to Anne, I don't I don't see them as romantic in a contemporary or a current te- like context. I just... No, I know these is creepy, quite toxic. Anyway, distraction. Catherine never saw Anne as a threat until it was too late. She was used to Henry taking mistresses and thought that Anne was just another one that we're favoured with time. Anne rarely came to court between May 1527 and the summer of 1529. It was around this time that Henry starts quoting Leviticus chapter 20 as the reason why he and Catherine's marriage isn't legitimate. If a man shall take his brother's wife, it is an unclean thing. He hath uncovered his brother's nakedness. They shall be childless. First of all, Henry, you're not childless. You have a child called Mary. The king also declared that he has had some doubts about his marriage for some years past. Henry was provoked into action during the spring of 1527 to get rid of Catherine when the Bishop of Tarbes questioned his daughter, heir, Mary, and her legitimacy. And to be honest, this wasn't the first time that his daughter's legitimacy was called into question. And the second reason was that he, he was passionately in love and wanted to marry. Or at least what he thinks is love. So what was Henry's issue with Catherine? Well, no male heir. She was Spanish, which was no longer fashionable. Henry preferred an alliance with France. He was now barren and they had very little in common. He had been questioning the relationship for years. His love for Anne was really only the catalyst. Henry told Catherine of his decision for an annulment on the 22nd of June 1527. Her view of Anne and peace of mind were shattered. Henry asked for her cooperation in the matter and she could choose a house to retire to. Catherine just wept and rejected Henry's offer and continued as nothing had happened. And for the rest of that year, Henry and Catherine would still appear at engagements together. However, at this time, Anne was also starting to act like she was queen. She now had her own ladies-in-waiting and as 1528 approached, Anne would be taking precedence over Catherine. By November 1528, the French ambassador noted, Greater court is now being paid to Mistress Anne than has ever been to the Queen for a long time. In April 1529, Anne took it upon herself to perform duties that were normally reserved for anointed queens. On June 21st, Catherine of Aragon had been called to Blackfriars Court, for an examination of the validity of her marriage to the king. The court was not in her favour, obviously, but she, being dramatic, knelt before her husband and begged him to stop the proceedings. Henry ignores her pleas. I'm not going to quote the full speech here because it's quite lengthy, but there were some bits that stood out for me. Sir, I beseech you, for all the loves that hath between us, and for the love of God, let me have justice and right. Alas, sir, where have I offended you? I take God and all the world to witness that I have been to you true, humble and obedient wife, ever comfortable to your will and pleasure. This twenty years and more I have been your true wife, and by me ye have had divers children, though it hath pleased God to call them out of this world, which have been no fault in me. And when ye had me at first, I take God to be my judge. I was a true maid, without touch of a man, and whether it be true or not, I put it to your conscience. When she had finished speaking, Catherine rose and curtsied. She then left the court and ignored her calls for her return, and was greeted outside by the public, who shouted words of support. Henry said nothing during Catherine's infamous speech, and when she had left, he declared Catherine as true and obedient, as comfortable a wife as I could in my fantasy, wish or desire. Henry made it clear to the court that he was concerned about the line of succession and that Catherine had not failed in producing children, but all of the sons that were born had died incontinent after they were born, and he believed that he had been punished by God. 
In September 1530, after forbidding Henry VIII to contract to a new marriage in the March, the Pope suggested that Henry had two wives, as this could cause less of a scandal than an annulment. The reason a divorce from Catherine would cause such a scandal is because if you remember, it was the Pope, albeit a different Pope, who gave the dispensation to the couple to wed after the death of Arthur, and Pope Clement VII could not undo the work of a previous Pope, because if he did, that would suggest that the previous Pope was wrong, and if the Pope was wrong, then God was wrong. Also, Catherine is part of the Spanish royal family, and her nephew was the Holy Roman Emperor Charles V, who had also kept the Pope captive for a few years. Emperor Charles also even offered to invade England on Catherine's behalf to end her troubles, but Catherine continually refused due to her loyalty to her husband and wanted nothing to do with the plans. 7th of February 1531, the King stood in Parliament and demanded that the Church of England recognise him as the supreme head of state. So they did. England remained Catholic, but they didn't follow the Pope, and apart from that, nothing really changed. May 31st of the same year, Henry and the court were staying at Windsor Castle. He was trying to make Catherine withdraw her appeal to Rome, but stubborn Catherine claimed, I am his true wife. The court was due to move to Woodstock on the 14th of July, but he moved the court early without telling Catherine. Mary or the Queen's attendants. A messenger from the King stayed behind to tell the Queen she had one month to vacate the castle. Henry would never see Catherine again, and he left without even saying goodbye. The Queen asked the messenger to express to the King her disappointment, to which the King flew into a violent, crying rage, saying he did not want her goodbyes, and I do not care whether she asks after my health or not, that she should mind her own business, and that he wanted no more of her messages. Catherine outstayed her welcome at Windsor until early August 1531, until she was commanded to leave, and she watched her daughter, the Princess Mary, leave to go to Richmond. Catherine relocated to East Hampstead. That Christmas, Catherine sent Henry a gold cup, as they always exchanged gifts, but he sent that back, claiming that he was no longer her husband, and that the Queen should know that. Henry and Anne's relationship was hotting up, However, they exchanged gifts at Christmas and on the 1st of September 1532, Henry made Anne the Marquess of Pembroke in her own right. Quite an achievement for a woman of that period. This was arranged rather quickly so that Anne would have rank and financial security if the king died suddenly. To many, this was a sign that Henry and Anne had finally slept together after years of foreplay. That Christmas... Anne found out that she was pregnant, and her and Henry bigamously wed in secret at Whitehall Palace on the 25th of January 1533, because remember, he wasn't actually divorced from Catherine yet. In the February, Henry moved Catherine to Amp Hill, so she was far away from London. On the 9th of April, Dukes Norfolk and Suffolk informed Catherine that the King had married and that she should now refer to herself as the Princess Dowager of Wales, the title that she had after Arthur died. Catherine was allowed to keep her properties, but Henry would now cease to pay for her household expenses and servants. Catherine took the news calmly, but she called herself Queen until she died. Their marriage was officially annulled on the 23rd of May, and Catherine was denied access to see her daughter, the former Princess, now Lady, Mary. Henry married Anne, who became queen, and gave birth to a daughter, Elizabeth. History's portrayal of Henry and Anne's relationship is incredibly interesting, as it changes depending on whose perspective you look at it from. Some people see their relationship as a classic love story, some as one of passion, and some take the view of Anne being a manipulative, ambitious woman who never loved Henry in the first place. A woman pushed from a family desperate to climb the political ladder. Well, we will never know as very little of the letters that Anne wrote to Henry still survive. We only have the ones from him to her. What we do know 
is Henry and Anne's courting started years before their marriage. Anne became queen in 1533, just after she married King Henry VIII in 1532. But their relationship started back in 1525. The marriage was delayed due to the king already being married. I can see how that held him up and trying to get an annulment. Check out the last episode for that. Anne was the lady-in-waiting for Queen Catherine of Aragon's household, which is where she first caught the king's eye. The king pursued Anne as a mistress, and the story goes that she refused to sleep with him, which was keeping him interested. Apparently it had nothing to do with her intelligence, wit or charm. However, despite the pushbacks, Anne did eventually give in, as she was pregnant during their wedding, and heavily so during the coronation, to the point that her ladies-in-waiting kept her potty handy under the table just in case. 1533, the king and queen welcomed the long-awaited baby. However, both parents were disappointed as the baby was a girl, Elizabeth, named after both their mothers. The royal couple were both expecting a boy, especially after the promises that the queen had made. Henry was furious and flew into a fit of rage. When he'd calmed down, he told Anne, the boys will follow. When she expressed regret at not having given him a boy, the Princess Mary was declared illegitimate and the heir to the throne was now the Princess Elizabeth. And any other children Henry and Anne would produce, three days later, the Princess Elizabeth was christened. Henry was still so furious at Elizabeth not being a boy that neither he or Anne attended their daughter's christening. Elizabeth was baptised with all the pomp, but the planned tournament, fireworks and bonfires, due to celebrate the new royal baby, were all cancelled. Elizabeth was undoubtedly Henry's heir, but she was not a welcomed one. Hindsight is a wonderful thing. If only they had known... Queen Anne feared that the former princess, now Lady Mary, posed a threat to her daughter Elizabeth's place in the line of succession. Henry soothed Anne's fears by separating many of her servants and sending Elizabeth to Hatfield House. The Lady Mary was then sent to wait on her sister as part of her household. And, as punishment for refusing to recognise Henry's marriage to Anne, and his religious reforms. December 1533, Jane Seymour, who was a lady-in-waiting to former Queen Catherine of Aragon, was moved to Anne Boleyn's household. After 1533, King Henry VIII begins to gain weight. He was less attractive than in his youth, and the crown of his head was bald, and his hairline was starting to recede, far from the athletic hunk that Catherine of Aragon was once married to. On the 23rd of March 1534, the Pope finally announced his judgement that Henry's true wife is Catherine of Aragon and that he needs to make amends and get rid of Anne or he will be excommunicated. At this point, I doubt Henry really cared as that threat had been thrown around a lot for the last seven years. And the Church of England no longer answered to the Pope anyway. In May 1534, Catherine is finally moved to Kim Bolton Castle and Anne Boleyn suffered a miscarriage in the December. 1535 was a turning point for Henry. The divorce between the King and the Pope forced the clergy and the others to choose their allegiance. Sir Thomas More, as devout Catholic, sided against the King. Wrong move, Sir Thomas More. And guess what? He was executed for treason. He also had his Catholic teacher, Cardinal John Fisher, beheaded for disagreeing with his plans for the Church of England and put his head on a spike. This was also the year that Anne decided she needed to get rid of Catherine of Aragon. Ironically, many historians agree that Anne's downfall was catalyzed by the death of Catherine. Anne told Henry that she had a dream where God revealed to her that it would be impossible to conceive a child while Catherine and Mary lived. Henry failed to rise to her bait, a sign of Anne's power over the king diminishing. Once Henry had gotten over himself, he decided that he quite liked his red-headed daughter and liked showing her off to visiting ambassadors 
much like he had done with Mary when she was younger. In the July, King Francis I agreed to enter negotiations for the marriage of Elizabeth and his third eldest son. Anne was thrilled, as many still saw the Lady Mary next in line, despite being illegitimate. This would only help to strengthen Elizabeth's claim. During early September, Anne and Henry stayed at Wolf Hall for six days, the family home of the Seymour family. Although there is no evidence, it seems likely that Henry and Jane's courtship might have started around this time. November 1535, Anne was pregnant again, so she continued to press Henry to execute Catherine and the Lady Mary out of fear for herself, Elizabeth and the unborn child. But Henry would not succumb to Anne's demands. Catherine then became very ill and this would be the beginning of the end for Catherine. 1st of December 1535, desperate or vindictive, you decide, but Anne thought Catherine may soon recover. She begged her husband to kill Catherine and Mary. Henry read Catherine's medical reports and knew that his ex-wife and former queen did not have long, so he didn't act. On the 30th of December 1535, it was apparent that Catherine was dying. Chapuis, the Spanish ambassador, informed the king, who said, When she is gone, the emperor will have no further excuses for interfering in English affairs. Chapuis responded, The death of the queen will be of no advantage. His imperial majesty will never abandon her while she lives. Henry shrugged. It does not matter. She will not live long. Henry gave Chapuis permission to visit Catherine, but banned his daughter Mary from seeing her dying mother. Chapuis travelled to Catherine at Kimbolton Castle. Chapuis noted that his friends looked so wasted that she could neither stand nor sit up in bed. In her will, Catherine left Mary the collar of gold which I bought out of Spain and her furs. Catherine asked Henry to make church garments out of her gowns. He refused and he didn't honour giving Mary her furs either. Catherine wrote a letter to Henry on the last evening of her life and in her final defiance, she signed the letter, Catherine, the Queen. Former Queen Catherine of Aragon died on the 7th of January, 1536, at the age of 50. And he rejoiced, God be praised that we are all free from all suspicion of war. And Anne declared, Now, I am indeed queen. Anne had always maintained that while Catherine lived, she was not safe. However, she was gravely mistaken. As long as Catherine lived, she was safe. Henry would not admit that he was wrong all the time Catherine is campaigning her right as queen. With Catherine gone, nothing was in the way for Henry to now get rid of Anne. Two days later, on the 9th of January, the royal couple held a court ball to celebrate England's liberation from the threat of war between England and Spain. Both Henry and Anne wore yellow, the colour of royal mourning in Spain, as a mark of respect. However, not all historians see this as such. Some view the wearing of yellow as a snub to Catherine, as they were dancing, enjoying life in bright colours, rather than being sombre and wearing black, the English colour of mourning. Henry took great pleasure in parading his daughter Elizabeth around the room. Catherine was to be buried as the Dowager Princess of Wales, and out of sheer happiness, Henry gave her a state funeral as magnificent as possible, despite not following her personal wishes. A 44-year-old Henry fell off his horse during a joust on the 24th of January that year. This fall didn't stop him at first, but this accident, along with others, that would follow began Henry's decline into the fat, foul-tempered monarch that we have become accustomed to, due to his inability to exercise. Catherine's funeral took place on the 29th of January, 1536, and the royal couple donned the colour yellow again, and a pregnant Anne was frustrated as the conversation seemed to be about Catherine and not her. That afternoon, Anne found Jane Seymour sitting 
on the king's knee and she flew into a frenzy. Fearing for their child, Henry sent Jane out of the room in hopes of calming Anne. Peace be, sweetheart, and all shall go well with thee, he soothed. Anne miscarried later that afternoon, and she would forever blame Jane. The fetus had a male appearance, and Chapuis noticed that she had miscarried of her saviour. Unsurprisingly, Henry was disappointed, and he commented, I see that God will not give me male children. It is evident that Henry is now questioning whether Anne should still remain queen, seeing as he was having the same issue with Anne as he had with Catherine. Anne and the king would later have a big argument in her bedchamber. Henry would blame a distraught Anne about the loss of a boy. She then blamed him, to which Henry retorted that she should have no boys with him. Anne then deflected that retort and blamed the wench Jane Seymour. Because the love I bear you is much greater than Catherine's, so my heart broke when I saw you loved others. Henry, quite clearly, did not have a leg to stand on, and he was sick of arguing, so he told Anne that he would speak with her when she was better, and then left her chamber mentally and physically. When the king had left, Anne told her ladies that she would soon be pregnant again and that she will bear another son, and this son will not be doubtful like this one, conceived during the life of the Princess Dowager. Again, somehow, blaming Catherine. The real reason for the miscarriage may have been because Anne was... Okay, I can't can't really pronounce this word. Rhesus negative, I think. I don't know. I'll, if you're watching on the YouTube version, I'll put the spelling up. But this basically meant that her first pregnancy, Elizabeth, was healthy and it produced a sub substance in the bloodstream called, oh my god, agul agulutinogen. Agulutinogen? Say it confidently and everyone will believe you. Which then destroys the rhesus positive red cells in any subsequ subsequent fetus usually with fatal results. So basically she had something in her blood and that every time she got pregnant, it would then attack that. So the more ch the more time she got pregnant, the less likely the baby was going to survive because of how her body was working. That's the TLDR of that. Obviously, the Tudors wouldn't have known that, but it explains why Anne was able to conceive, but she wasn't able to carry the baby to term. As early as January 1536, Cromwell and Chapuis were scheming to get rid of Anne. More Cromwell than Chapuis, but they were still helping each other out. And Henry was parading his affections for Jane, the same way he did for Anne in front of Catherine. And for once, Anne knew exactly how her former rival felt. Presents and messages arrived regularly for Jane from Henry and Anne's disgust and jealousy made her more difficult to live with and on more than one occasion Anne lashed out at Jane and slapped her. Once Jane received a locket containing a miniature from Henry and she made a great show of opening it in front of Anne who then ripped it from Jane's neck so violently that she cut her own finger. I think Anne would have loved to have got rid of Jane as one of her ladies-in-waiting, but I think the backlash she would have got from Henry would not have been worth it and it would have put her in a very dangerous situation. Anne rarely saw her husband during the early months of 1536 and spent most of her time at Greenwich doing charity work and playing with her dogs. A common theme in 1536 is the swap of favours. When Anne is in the king's favour, Cromwell is out of it and vice versa. In the Easter of that year, Cromwell is disgraced by the king and is removed from court, which put Anne back into the king's favour. Anne went in procession to the chapel on the Tuesday after Easter. Chapuis bowed to her, something that he had never done, something that he would be so ashamed of. 
and the fact that Anne was here and commanding such power at this event was evidence of her being back in her husband's favour. Cromwell, on the other hand, knew that he was in a dangerous position, so he asked for two weeks off because he was ill. He wasn't really, but he had sent his spies to the court to get any dirt he could on the Queen. Anne was not popular with many at court. She was actually known for being quite a cruel mistress. However, that's only if you weren't part of the Boleyn faction. If you were part of the Boleyn slash Howard faction, then she'd actually treat you quite favourably. But if you weren't, she could have been quite nasty at times. So it didn't really take much convincing for some of the ladies to give up the tiniest bit of information, even if it was factual or not. Most of it not. Henry needed Anne out of the way if he wanted to marry Jane. Anne was most likely innocent, and I think most historians um, agree on this conclusion, but Henry had decided that she needed to go. If I could choose one word to describe the downfall or trial of Anne Boleyn, if you, if you like, I would probably say convenient. That's what this whole thing was. To Henry, if it was convenient in terms of getting Anne out of the way, he chose to believe it or he went for it. So Henry had pretty much convinced himself that Anne had been adulterous because it was convenient. If she had committed adultery, he could get rid of her to marry Jane. So he had genuinely convinced himself that she had been adulterous and he flew into a rage. He then gave the orders for his wife's arrest on the 29th of April, 1536. So Anne returning to power on that Easter really did not last that long. And that was kind of how the power play between her and Cromwell kept playing out during this period of time. Like when one was in favour, it would not be for long before the other one switched. And I think it just so happens on this flip that Cromwell had just played the better hand than Anne. On the 2nd of May 1536, Anne was watching tennis when she was summoned to the Privy Council. Her uncle Norfolk, Sir William Fitzwilliam and Sir William Paulette, all grimaced, stood in front of her and charged her with having committed adultery with Norris Smeaton and one other guy who was not named. She was informed that the two named men had confessed their guilt. Although this was actually post-torture, and even in the Tudor times, this confession should not have been valid. But guess what? It was convenient! Apparently, Norfolk was tutting at his niece like a naughty schoolgirl upon her arrest. This is the same uncle that would be responsible for the downfall of Anne's cousin and his other niece, Catherine Howard. The Duke of Norfolk, the third Duke of Norfolk, should I say, is a nasty piece of work. He is genuinely one of those human beings that I would not have liked to have met because I just think he's foul and he's just vile and he just puts power in front of everything. But, I mean, that's neither here nor there. I just don't like him. Anne was stunned and did not respond because she was innocent. Anne was escorted to her apartments at the Tower of London. She was told that she did not need to pack as everything would be there. It was at this point that Anne's mental health started to wane. She tried to appear composed, but she would be seen crying and begging with people en route. She asked Mr Kingston, her jailer, if she would be going to the dungeons. No, madam, he replied, you shall go to your lodging you lay in at your coronation. It is too good for me, she sobbed. Her sorrow fell into great laughter a behaviour she would exhibit several times during her stay. Anne was worried as she had teased Norris about him delaying his marriage, saying he looked for dead men's shoes. For if aught came to the king, you would look to have me. Norris was shocked and denied this. Anne, at the time, was playful. Yet yeah, Playful teasing was something that she had always done at the French court. It was very much the in thing to do. However, the French court was very different to the English court, and this would have been seen potentially as adulterous. She now feared that her remarks had been overheard, 
and could be misconstrued, which they had. Francis Weston had come to Anne's chamber on Whit Monday, and Anne had playfully teased him as well, asking if he loved Madge Shelton. Now, Madge Shelton, actually, there's some debate with historians whether she's Madge or whether she's another name. Uh, there was a few M. Sheltons running about, but I'm going to go with Madge for this. So, Madge Shelton uh, was a lady and relative of Anne's. He had replied that he loved one in her house better than her, as in Madge. Which, to be fair to Sir Francis Weston, in court, that would have been the correct answer because the king and the queen are supposed to be the most desirable people, even if you didn't actually think so. So his response was actually a good response because if he had said no, like he would be insulting the queen, but then if he said yes, then it was a case of like, you're being unfaithful to Madge. So he really couldn't have said anything other than what he did say. But the issue is, is that Anne then took it a step further and she asked who, to which he replied, it is yourself. Unfortunately, this is all the evidence that Cromwell and his rumour mill needed. Henry wanted to be divorced from Anne before executing her, so he didn't have the mess similar to the divorce with Catherine. Thankfully, with there being a new church and Henry being the head of that new church, divorce from Anne was a bit easier. And because Henry had had sexual relations with Anne's sister Mary, the marriage was seen as incestuous. Anne had maintained that the worst that Henry could do to her was divorce her. You know, that that's what you did at the time. The thought of her being executed was actually out of the question. Although with Anne's hysteria, as soon as she entered the tower, it's possible that it had crossed her mind. Now, from our point of view, the fact that Henry executed Anne and then obviously her cousin Catherine Howard, we just go, oh, that's something that he did. But I just want to point out that when in that time, when he did it, that was a monstrous thing to do. Like, they, that just, that was unheard of. And that the other kings in Europe were equally disgusted by the fact that Henry had done that. You just don't do that, which is why you got the marriages annulled, or you wait for them to die naturally. On the 8th of May 1536, the five men who allegedly had committed adultery with the Queen, including her brother George, were executed before large crowds. Again, the fact that Henry decided to dissolve the marriage because he'd slept with uh, and sister Mary because that was incestuous and the fact that he had to get special permission to, mar uh, to marry Catherine from the Pope because again she had slept with his brother so again that was seen as incestuous the idea that Anne would then sleep with her brother it, like that's actual incest and that's just a big like no-no even in like Tudor times brother and sister nah nah that would have been grim even for the Tudors the Queen was taken to the Bell Tower, as its windows overlooked Tower Hill, so she could watch them die. Understandably, this greatly aggravated her grief. George mounted the scaffold first and made a long and pious speech, of which there are apparently three versions. Then Weston, then Norris, and Bereton, and then finally Smeaton. Anne was also accused of witchcraft along with adultery. Witches were normally burnt at the stake, and Anne was told that she would be beheaded and that the king had given her the mercy of a sword, which was quicker and cleaner than an axe, and she was getting the best swordsman from France. This is potentially more evidence that Anne was innocent, and to be honest, would Henry have cared about giving her a swift end if he believed her guilt? No, not really. Also, on this day, Anne was stripped of her title as Queen. Her marriage to Henry was declared invalid, and she would be beheaded as the Lady Marquess of Pembroke, not Queen of England. This was Henry's way of numbing the backlash. As I said, executing your Queen is an outrage, a scandal. Executing a Lady or Marquess, not so much. 
The next day, Cranmer came to hear Anne's last confession. She swore of the damnation of her soul that she had never been unfaithful to her lord and husband and affirmed that she had never offended with her body against the king. Anne was supposed to die on the 18th of May. However, Kingston told Anne that the executioner had been delayed and that it would be tomorrow. Anne thought she would be dead by now and said, I thought to be dead before this time and pass my pain. Kingston told her that there should be no pain. Anne replied, I have heard say the executioner was very good and I have a little neck. She then put her hands around her neck and laughed heartily. Henry, on the other hand, was preparing to marry Jane Seymour and had asked Cranmer to issue a dispensation to allow the marriage to take place, as Henry and Jane were related. Jane's grandmother, Elizabeth Neville, was a cousin of Henry's great-grandmother, Cecily Neville, Duchess of York. Henry spent the evening with Jane at Strand, who was dressed as a queen. Anne could not sleep that night. She prayed and talked with her ladies. She was calm and sometimes cheery, even making jokes, saying that people would call her Queen Anne Lackhead, as in like she lacked a head. After her death, Anne had come to the resolve that her execution was God's judgment for her harsh treatment of the Lady Mary. 19th of May, 1536, Anne's execution day. Henry wore white the day of Anne's execution, the colour of mourning in France, a token of respect for his late queen, despite not watching the execution, as he spent the day with Jane and played a bit of tennis. Henry invited 1,000 people to watch Anne's execution, which in itself is not normal for a noble execution. Anne was the first English queen to be publicly executed. When Anne was executed, Guns were fired to signify the Queen's death. The speed that Henry moved on after Anne is actually quite disturbing. In the royal palaces, carpenters, masons and seamstress were working to remove Anne's initials, where it occurred, and replace it with Jane's. Portraits of Anne's were taken down and hidden. It was to look as if she had never existed, and not once during the years left to Henry, would he ever be heard uttering her name. The next day, King Henry VIII and Jane Seymour would be engaged. History often portrays Jane as Henry's favourite wife and the one that he truly, deeply loved. However, I ain't fully sold on that. I think she was his favourite, yes, but I think the only reason she was his favourite was because she gave him a boy. You know, the boy that he spent decades longing for, the boy that both Catherine and Anne Boleyn could not provide him. I think also he was, she was potentially his favourite because they just hadn't been married long enough for her to annoy him properly, you know? And I do believe that if Jane had not given Henry the son and she had not died in childbirth, I think her story would be an entirely different one. As I said in the last video, towards the end of Henry's marriage to Anne Boleyn, Jane had become Henry's mistress and was flaunting the king's affection. One key thing to note here is that Jane is often portrayed as meek and mild, but she played the same game that Anne played against Catherine. There are a lot of parallels between Jane and Anne's rise in the king's affections, such as flaunting the king's affection, taking precedence over the current queen and acting as if she was queen prior to marriage. The only difference was the king and his temperament, but Catherine and Anne were strong-headed women and in his old age, not that he was particularly old, but by Tudor standards he was, the king was becoming less tolerant of strong-willed women. Jane and her successors realise that in order to retain favour, they must adopt an adoring and submissive attitude. Anne Boleyn was beheaded on the 19th of May, 1536. Henry and Jane became engaged the day after. 
Henry wore white on both days. This was a sign of respect, as this was the colour of mourning in France. This, to me, is also more evidence that when Henry and Anne wore yellow for Catherine of Aragon's funeral and death, that they were doing it out of a sign of respect, rather than trying to snub Catherine. As, don't forget, yellow was also the colour of mourning for Spain. After Anne's death, Henry did not want to look at Elizabeth, his daughter that he had with Anne, so he had her taken to Hatfield House, a residence that Elizabeth would spend a lot of time at. Henry's relationship with his other daughter, Mary, was also really rocky, as Mary was adamant that her mother's marriage to Henry was legal, while Henry was adamant that he would not be on good grounds with his daughter, the Lady Mary, until she accepts the marriage was not legal and him as the head of the Church of England. Ten days after his engagement to Jane Seymour, Henry and Jane wed at Whitehall Palace. Henry's wedding gift to his wife was a gold cup designed by the royal painter Hans Holbein, and it was engraved with the couple's initials, which was entwined in a love knot. The cup also had the Queen's motto engraved in it. The cup unfortunately no longer exists, as it was melted down in 1629. Jane was then proclaimed Queen on the 4th of June. However, she was never coronated. This could have been down to the fact that there was a plague in London at the time, and Henry was a massive germaphobe. Although, after what happened to his brother catching the sweating sickness, I can understand this. Her coronation was planned for October, but it was cancelled due to the pilgrimage of grace, and it might have also been because Henry had already had two wives, two wives that he had coronated, and neither of those two wives had produced him a male heir, so it could have been the fact that Henry was waiting for Jane to prove herself before he spent the money on making her queen. In June came the Second Succession Act. This document made both Elizabeth and Mary illegitimate, and downgraded from the princess to the lady. Although, for Mary, this didn't really change much because she had been made the Lady Mary when Henry had married Anne Boleyn, but now both Elizabeth and Mary were to be referred to as the ladies Elizabeth and Mary rather than princesses. Both Mary and Elizabeth were then put behind any children that Henry and Jane may have. It also stated that if Queen Jane failed to produce any issue with the king, the king was granted the power to appoint anyone he chose to be his lawful successor, and that included the issue of any other lawful wife. Also, in the same month, Lady Mary gave in and offers her father her submission. She didn't really mean it though, but she just thought for an easier life she might as well. I mean, it was probably easier for her to have her father on side than to not have him on side. What was rather nice, though, is the fact that it seems Henry welcomed his daughter back into his life and was ready to play the loving father role. However, it's worth noting that he was extremely irritated at how long it took Mary to come to this conclusion. The 23rd of June was a sad day for King Henry, as his only surviving, albeit illegitimate, son, Henry Fitzroy, Duke of Richmond and Somerset, died. The king reacted with a mixture of grief and denial, and was convinced that his witch of an ex-wife, Anne Boleyn, had given Henry Fitzroy a slow-releasing poison. So even beyond the grave, she is being accused of stuff she didn't do. So at this point in English history... Henry VIII had commissioned the dissolution of the monasteries. This was to help England's transition from a Catholic to a Protestant state, but it was mainly to fill the king's coffers, as the Catholic churches were renowned for being full of really expensive stuff. As a result, in the autumn of 1536, a revolt started called the Pilgrimage of Grace. The rebellion began with a riot in the town of Louth in Lincolnshire, where the inhabitants felt that the king had gone too far with his religious reforms. The army of people marched south, its leaders carrying banners depicting the five wounds of Christ, 
which is what gave the rebellion its name. They saw their cause as nothing less than a crusade. They had hopes that they could convince the king to make amends with Rome and restore or leave the remaining monasteries alone. This was probably the peak in Jane's queenship, other than producing an heir, as she didn't really do much. In late October, the queen fell to her knees at court and begged Henry to restore some of the smaller monasteries, and she suggested that the rebellion was sent by God as he was not happy with Henry for ruining so many of the churches. Unsurprisingly, Henry was furious with his queen and her defiance. He reminded her that the last queen died as a result of too much meddling in politics. Jane listened to her husband's warning and never treaded that line again. This contributes to what we know, or what we think we know, about Jane being meek and mild. I just think the difference between Anne and Jane was that Jane was smart enough to hold her tongue when necessary. That December, Henry agreed to meet Robert Ask, the leader of the Pilgrimage of Grace, and accept his demands, one of which was that the Queen was to be crowned in York. With everything happening in London, the rest of the country would, at times, feel very disconnected, which is why the monarchy would go on procession of the country, just to show their faces every now and then. Henry's compliance brought peace to the country, ready for Christmas, even though Henry had no intention of actually following the demands through. After all, he was the king, not Robert Ask. Christmas was a cute time for the royal family. Henry and Mary's relationship improved, and Mary got on well with her stepmother. As a result, Mary managed to persuade her father to let Elizabeth join the family. Henry and Jane sat together at the table, and Mary sat opposite Jane. Elizabeth was too young to join the adults, but it was noted that Henry played with his youngest daughter very affectionately. It's also at this time we find out that Henry had already chosen the name for his son and heir, as he thought that Jane was pregnant, patting her belly, saying, Edward, Edward. I mean, chances are she'd probably just eaten a bit too much and was bloated. Henry didn't have to wait long, as Jane announced that she was pregnant in April 1537, and the Queen craved quail eggs during her pregnancy. They were out of season, so Henry had to go to great lengths getting them for his Queen. They were shipped to England from Calais and from Flanders. On the 12th of October 1537, King Henry VIII was at Esther. Esther? Escher? Oh, I should really know how to say that. When his son and heir, Edward, was born, Edward was immediately given the title Duke of Cornwall, which is the customary dukedom that is given to heir to the throne, a bit like Prince of Wales. Jane had given birth to the couple's son at Hampton Court Palace. Interestingly enough, her bedroom is now used as a meeting room by the staff at the palace. Jane's sister-in-law, Lady Anne Stanhope, also gave birth to a boy named Edward, in another room of the palace at the same time. Henry was still concerned about plague, so he had Edward's apartments washed with soap and swept daily. Three days later, the new prince was christened at the Chapel Royal in Hampton Court Palace. Cranmer, Norfolk, Suffolk and the Lady Mary were assigned as godparents, and Elizabeth was still in the procession, and she was carried by Queen Jane's brother, Edward Seymour. On the 23rd of October, Henry was due to return to Escher, Esther, Esther, eh, to hunt, but Jane had been ill since Edward's christening and he could not find it in his heart to leave Jane in such a state. Some historians use this as evidence of a genuine love connection between these two, but in my personal opinion, I think Henry was more concerned about losing his prized baby maker. After all, he is on wife number three and she's the only one to provide a male heir, and if she can do it once, she can do it a second time. Henry remained at his wife's side throughout the evening and into the night. Jane died in her sleep the next day at Hampton Court Palace, and Henry just couldn't cope with mortality, and he fled to Windsor Castle. I think being next to a dead body was just a bit too much for him. That meant that the Duke of Norfolk had to sort out the funeral arrangements. While at Windsor, Henry refused to see anyone, When Henry emerged from his isolation, his ministers nervously suggested a fourth marriage, 
for the sake of the realm. He was in need of a spare, and Henry agreed. Henry himself, don't forget, was a spare, and his eldest son, Fitzroy, suddenly died in his late teens, so Henry knew the importance of the spare. Edward himself was a baby, and his life was not guaranteed, which Henry also witnessed with the birth of Henry, Duke of Cornwall, in 1511. Jane was laid in state at the Chapel Royal at Hampton Court Palace. The body was dressed in a robe of gold tissue with a crown on its head and some of the Queen's jewels. Jane was the only one of Henry's queens to die as Queen and as such was buried at Windsor Castle. She received a royal funeral and would eventually be joined by her husband in 1547. We don't know how old Jane was when she died, but she had 29 ladies walking in procession behind her at the funeral, and the custom was to have the amount of ladies walking for each year that they were alive. So we can infer that she was 29 when she died, meaning she was likely born in 1507, 1508-ish. Henry wore black for three months after Jane's death, Jane, like Catherine Parr, has been noted as the wife slash queen that encouraged a family unit. This is evident in the Christmas that they shared in 1536. And if she had lived longer, I think she would have continued to mend the rift between the king and his children. Would she have had more children? We will never know. People often document Henry's life based on his wives, with the misconception that he had wives back to back which is sometimes the case, especially with the first three and with wives number four and five. But it is often forgotten that there was a three-year period where Henry wasn't married. Today, we'll be looking at King Henry VIII, The Bachelor. We start our story in 1537, and King Henry VIII is a grieving widow as his third wife and mother of his only legitimate son, Jane Seymour had just died. Although it's also worth pointing out that he was Henry's only son as his illegitimate son, Henry Fitzroy, had died in 1536, just weeks after the execution of Anne Boleyn. And even then, from the grave, Henry found a way of blaming her, accusing her of using a slow-releasing poison to kill his son. And Henry Fitzroy was the only son at that point because Prince Edward had not been born. Henry's advisers told him he should look for a fourth wife to continue the line of succession. After all, Henry was in need of a spare. Despite being a king on the dating market, he wasn't as much of a catch as you would have thought he was. His depression in his widowhood was the start of his weight gain. He was foul-tempered and his ill health made him unpredictable. Henry was also ageing as rapidly as his first wife, Catherine of Aragon, and was starting to go bald. Despite this, Henry did enter talks with several women, which included Christina, Duchess of Milan, Mary of Guise, and King Francis I for the hand of his daughters. However, Henry and Francis's negotiations ended rather quickly, as Henry insulted Francis early on when he asked Francis to send his daughters to Calais so Henry could choose the daughter that he liked the most. From Henry's point of view, he wanted to meet his wife and converse with her first. Pretty understandable. However, Francis laughed at the idea, finding it preposterous and insulting. He was not prepared to have his daughters or ladies of court being taken out like prized animals. With the French alliance abandoned, Henry then read about the charms of the 16-year-old Christina, Duchess of Milan. She was 16, very tall, and of excellent beauty. The English envoy, John Hutton, remarked that he believed Christina bed a resemblance to the Lady Shelton, a woman at Henry's court that the king had openly admired. Side note, she was also a relative of Anne Boleyn. Henry definitely had a thing for that family. Christina seemed perfect. The only aspect that went against her was Henry's personal preference of bosom women. His second wife, Anne Boleyn, was supposedly slim, and he reportedly didn't like that as much, whereas his first and third wife, Catherine and Jane, 
were bosom women. The king declared, I am big in person and have need of a big wife. With that in mind, Henry put Christina on the back burner and set his sights on French noblewoman Mary of Guise, mother of Mary Queen of Scots, although she wasn't at this point. Mary of Guise had also been recently widowed and was the eldest daughter of Claude, Duke of Guise, one of the most powerful men in France, and rumour had it she was as bosom as the king desired. After a quiet Christmas at Greenwich, Henry put the feelers out for Mary's hand in January 1538. Mary, fortunately, had been given prior warning and hurriedly accepted the hand of another suitor, Henry's nephew, King James V of Scotland, whom she married in the following May. Thomas Cromwell then suggested that Henry go back to pursuing Christina. In the March, Henry sent his painter, Hans Holbein, to Brussels to paint Christina's picture, and he spent much of the summer at Hampton Court Palace with his three children. When Henry received Christina's portrait, he was apparently enchanted, so he sent his embassy to approach Christina. The embassy approached Christina on the 7th of October, 1538. The young duchess was very outspoken, and the idea of marrying King Henry VIII didn't appeal to her much. To be honest, I don't blame her. The king's majesty was in so little space rid of queens that she dare not trust his council, though she does trust his majesty, for her council suspected that her great aunt, Catherine of Aragon, was poisoned, that the second was innocently put to death, and that the third lost for lack of keeping in her childbed. Apparently, and this is apparently, Christina said, If what she said is true, then Christina had a pretty good grasp on what King Henry VIII was like. Despite the English's best attempts, Christina said no. And her uncle, the Holy Roman Emperor, also stepped in to prevent the match. Back in England, Cromwell was under immense pressure from Henry. His favour was waning. Then, he remembered that the Duke of Cleves had two unmarried Protestant daughters. Sisters Anne and Amelia, or Anna and Amalia, were as yet unmarried and Protestant. Delighted by the offer, the Duke offered his two youngest daughters. The English ambassadors arrived in Dusseldorf on the 12th of January 1539. However, they were not received by John III, Duke of Cleves, as he had died since the arrangement. Instead, the ambassadors were received by his only son, William, the new Duke of Cleves. William had strong views about women's modesty, so when ladies Anne and Amelia were presented, they were so well covered with a habit and apparel that the ambassadors could hardly see their faces, let alone their figures. Duke William did not like the idea of Hans Holbein painting portraits of his sisters. He wanted his painter, Lucas Cranach, to paint the portraits, much to Henry's dislike. William then expressed his concern about marrying one of his sisters to King Henry VIII, as any woman married to Henry would only know insecurity and unhappiness. And then he said that the Cleves were too poor to pay for a dowry. I think William had sussed Henry out rather quickly. Cromwell came to the compromise that no dowry would need to be paid if the king could send Holbein to paint one of the women, and Henry liked the picture. Cromwell chose the Lady Anne as rumour had it she was incredibly beautiful compared to her sister. Anne was rather intelligent. She could read and write in High Dutch, a language that Henry couldn't speak, and she was an expert needlewoman. However, she couldn't speak French, Latin, or English, one of Henry's tongues, although it was thought that she was intelligent enough that she could pick up the language. Because of the modesty of the German court, she couldn't sing or play an instrument, nor did she know anything about fashion or dancing, as both had been scorned at her home court. The Catholic Lady Mary was dismayed that her father was to marry a Lutheran heretic. Ironically, Mary and her stepmother Anne would later become good friends, and it was Mary that led to Anne's conversion to Catholicism. 
By the 11th of December 1539, Anne of Cleves had reached Calais and stayed there due to bad weather. With Anne's arrival delayed, Henry kept himself busy with negotiations for a proposed marriage between the Lady Mary and Duke Philip of Bavaria, another Protestant ruler. Mary declared that she would rather remain unmarried than enter such an alliance. Nevertheless, Henry pursued the match, and when Philip came to London, Mary was obliged to go to court to greet him. Unwillingly, she obeyed, and the Duke afterwards told her father that he wished to proceed with the marriage. Mary faked an illness, so she didn't have to spend time with him, and eventually, the marriage never materialised. The decline of Henry's own German marriage is what helped with the lack of enthusiasm for the marriage in the end. Spoiler alert! New Year's Eve, 1539, Anne of Cleves arrived at Bishop's Palace. While here, Anne stood at the window watching bull baiting. Three men in multicoloured hoods leapt into the room, laughing. The burliest offered a gift from the king. Baffled, because remember she doesn't speak English or any other language other than High Dutch, Anne took it, then returned to the window. The stranger said something. Anne muttered something in German and turned away again. There was a long silence. The man stood confused and then frustrated. He left. Moments later, he returned, this time wearing a magnificent purple robe. Only now did Anne realise that he was her future husband. She tried to smile, but it was too late. When Henry met his future wife properly, he showed no sign of dislike towards his bride. He welcomed her to England with great courtesy and he stayed for the afternoon engaging in conversation with the help of a translator, while Anne ate supper. Henry felt betrayed and deceived as he felt that Anne looked nothing like her painting. He had brought with him a present of furs, but he was in such a state of agitation that he forgot to give them to Anne, and Sir Anthony Brown later presented them to her. The king excused himself, and when Brown caught him in the corridor, he could see the king was in a furious temper. Scowling, he said, I see nothing in this woman as men report of her, and I marvel that wise men would make such report as they have done. Henry blamed Cromwell who reminded his king that if the marriage did not go through, England would stand alone against France and Spain. Anne herself had done no wrong, and it would be most unchivalrous of the king to reject her at this late stage. If he sent her home disgraced, no man would consider her after that, and her brother may retaliate by declaring war on Henry. The king apparently stalked out of the council chamber in a rage, and the wedding between King Henry VIII and Lady Anne of Cleves took place on the 6th of January, 1540, at Greenwich Palace. Our story starts on Tuesday, the 6th of January, 1540, at Greenwich Palace. King Henry VIII was up early and dressed in his wedding clothes, a gown of cloth of gold, embroidered with great flowers of silver and banded with black fur a coat of crimson satin slashed and embroidered and fastened with huge diamonds. He walked with his nobles and said, My lords, if it were not to satisfy the world and my realm, I would not do what I must do this day for any earthly thing. He had made it clear to Cromwell that this was his fault, and should this marriage not work, it would be Cromwell that would be suffering the consequence. Anne was also wearing a gold gown embroidered with flowers. Her dress was cut in the Dutch fashion, having a round skirt with no train. Her hair hanged loose, a mark of her virginity, and she wore a coronet of gold set with precious stones. The two were then married in the chapel of Greenwich. It wasn't long before the whole court was laughing at the royal marriage farce. Fortunately for Anne, she didn't speak a lot of English and therefore she didn't realise that she was the butt of many cruel jokes. Despite this, Anne actually managed to settle into her position at court with dignity and she was well liked and admired for her courage and common sense. 
On the 11th of January 1540, Anne attended a tournament that was being held in her honour. She ditched the Dutch fashion and dressed in an English gown, accompanied by a French hood, in order to try and impress her husband. However, three days later, Cromwell told the council that the new queen remained a virgin because the king's highness liked not her body and could not be provoked or stirred to that act, though able to do the act with other than her. Tradition dictated that a new queen should make a state entry into London prior to her coronation, as had been done with the previous three wives. However, Henry abandoned his plans for a February coronation. He didn't give Anne an explanation as to why, and dismissed most of her servants back to Cleves. However, I will actually stand up for Henry on this point. I don't believe that dismissing the attendants was actually a move out of cruelty on Henry's part. According to Anne Bassett, who had been appointed as one of Queen Anne's attendants in the December of 1539, when Henry and his queen arrived at Whitehall Palace in February 1540, Queen Anne had brought with her so many German attendants that even allowing for those who'd been sent home, there was no place for Anne Bassett or several other English ladies in her household. Anne Bassett had complained about this in a letter to her mother, Lady Lyle, and within a week, a spot was found for Anne in the Queen's household. Henry's marriage to Anne of Cleves had been a political move by Cromwell. The country was officially Protestant, and Cromwell had hopes that by marrying a Protestant princess, this may strengthen the country's religion and put down any Catholics. However, Henry had retained most of the old Catholic rituals when he broke with the Pope, and Anne, bear in mind a strict Protestant, was happy to conform to all of the outward forms of Catholic worship. In April 1540, it was noted that the king had crept too near another lady, which historians believe was most likely Catherine Howard. She was the niece of the Duke of Norfolk and a first cousin of Anne Boleyn. Catherine was a pawn in the Catholic nobles' plan. She had been deliberately placed in the Queen's household as a maid of honour, with detailed instructions as to how to attract the king's attention. Norfolk had already seen one niece attain the consort's throne and saw no reason why another should not aspire to the same dignity. Besides, this one was younger, prettier and much easier to manipulate. King Henry VIII was enamoured with his wife's maid of honour. He gave Catherine substantial grants of land that he had confiscated off of criminals and Catherine's youth rejuvenated Henry and in turn he showered her with gifts. As such, and under instruction from her uncle, Catherine encouraged the king's advances. Although her uncle Norfolk had planned to replicate his success with Anne Boleyn, Catherine was no Anne. She was far younger than what her cousin had been, and her education had been nowhere near what Anne's had been, leaving her head, how should I say, barely vacant. Catherine flattered the king, and she pretended not to notice his badly ulcered leg, nor did she flinch at its stench. The Catholic faction at court encouraged the affair. Queen Anne of Cleves was now not so naive as she was formerly. She watched Catherine flirt with her husband. However, unlike Henry's previous wives, Anne wasn't in love with her husband, so... She bore Catherine no ill will on a personal level, but her husband's new mistress did make her fearful. May Day 1540, Henry and Anne appeared at joust together to celebrate the holiday. The couple, much to Cromwell's despair, were not any closer, and Henry continued to moan to Cromwell about his wife. The marriage that, don't forget, Cromwell arranged. The Queen is waxed, willful and stubborn with him. I don't think it's occurred to Henry that maybe she could be suffering anxiety. She's in a country where she can't speak the language. 
people are gossiping about her and he's neglecting her for one of her ladies-in-waiting. But don't worry about it, Henry. It's Defo Anne's fault. Got nothing to do with you, mate. Don't worry about it. Cromwell is then arrested and charged with heresy and treason in the following month of June. Cromwell had been pushing his religious reforms too far for an Anglo-Catholic Henry and the failure of his fourth marriage was a massive faux pas. Cromwell was arrested on the 10th of June. He entered the council chambers as usual, but the Duke of Norfolk arrested him in the King's name. He was taken to the Tower of London by barge and a bill of attainter against Cromwell was drawn up and given to Parliament. On the 23rd of June, 1540, Anne of Cleves was sent to the Palace of Richmond on the pretext that there was plague in London. Henry had promised to join Anne in two days, but he didn't. What he actually did was make himself visibly seen being rowed in broad daylight to Catherine Howard, who was at Lambeth Palace. The Bishop Gardiner entertained Henry and Catherine to banquets at his palace in Southwark. Henry had the royal barge seen every night on its way to Lambeth and used the excuse that he was visiting the Dowager Duchess of Norfolk. But nobody was fooled. Catherine, like her predecessors Anne Boleyn and Jane Seymour, employed the tactics of welcoming the royal advances once a wedding ring was on her finger. Henry was blissfully unaware that he was being manipulated And this was the last time in his life that he would be passionately in love. On the 29th of June, a desperate Cromwell wrote to Henry, pleading for his life. I ask mercy where I have offended, but I have done my best. No one can justly accuse me of having done wrong willfully. His attempt to get his life spared failed. Even Archbishop Cranmer interceded on his behalf, but Henry was adamant. Cromwell must die. When Cromwell realised that he was indeed to suffer the extreme penalty of death, he grew frantic and sent another letter to the king, pleading for his life, which ended with, Most gracious prince, I cry for mercy, mercy, mercy. But the king had none. On the 6th of July, Parliament discussed the legality of Henry's marriage to Anne and he was willing to risk angering the Duke of Cleves. Anne was told later that day that her husband had decided to annul the marriage. Henry assured the clergy, who were investigating the marriage arrangement, that he had no ulterior motive to arrange a divorce. Yeah, right, it's got nothing to do with the fact you want to marry Catherine Howard. I'm not sure who Henry thinks he's kidding, Hmm, you'll have to let me know what you think in the comment section down below. He claims that when the Cleves marriage had been suggested, he was anxious to proceed. Because I heard so much both of her excellent beauty and virtuous behaviour, he agreed. But when he first met her, he liked her so ill that I woe that ever she came into England and deliberated with myself that... If it were possible to find some means to break off, I would never enter yoke with her. Anne was told on the 9th of July that her marriage to the king was to be annulled, and from now on it would please the king if she referred to herself as his sister. So she could use the title of the king's sister, which is actually a very high honour. She fainted when she heard the news, but declared her consent for the annulment. As a thanks for her cooperation in the annulment, Anne was to receive £4,000 a year from the Crown, which, according to the National Archives website, is the equivalent of £1,685,428.80p, as well as the manors of Bletchingley, Richmond and Hever Castle, the childhood home of Anne Boleyn. The world knew that Anne was still a virgin, and Henry, by giving Anne the title of the king's sister, had made it easy for her to remarry, should she wish to. Henry sent Dr Watton to Cleves to tell Anne's brother William that the marriage had been annulled, and Anne 
also asked him to pass on the message that she would not be returning to Cleves and that she would prefer to live in England. Privately, her brother thought Henry's behaviour was deplorable, but considering what had happened to Henry's other wives, he was glad that his sister had fared no worse. On the 11th of July, at the request of the Privy Council, the now Lady Anne wrote a tactful letter to the King, formally acknowledging the dissolution of the marriage, in which she says that your Royal Highness will take me for your sister, for the which I most humbly thank you accordingly. She then signed the letter herself as Your Majesty's humble sister and servant Anne, the daughter of Cleves. As I said, the role of the king's sister was prestigious. It would mean that she would take precedence over most of the ladies of the kingdom and a place at court would always be reserved for her. As is evident by her not wanting to return to Cleves, Anne had grown to love England and she was now fortunate enough to own three of the most charming houses the country had to offer. Henry's fourth marriage was officially annulled on the 12th of July 1540. Although grateful, Henry found Anne's compliance a bit suspicious. He could not conceive that anyone could be so candid and straightforward. Anne promised to let Henry see any letters that she received from abroad and to be bound by his advice concerning matters raised in them and by reassuring her brother of the king's greatness in hopes that it would satisfy Henry. She did, however, ask her ex-husband of one last request. Anne was friends with his daughters, the Lady Mary, because they were of similar age, and the Lady Elizabeth, who Anne had actually taken a shine to. Anne had no interest in remarrying. I mean, I think the first time was traumatic enough. And so it would be unlikely that she would ever have children. Anne was charmed by Elizabeth's beauty and wit and hoped that she could potentially provide the young girl of seven some motherly love. Anne asked Henry if she might be permitted to invite Elizabeth to visit her one occasion, saying that to have had her for her daughter would have been greater happiness to her than being queen. Maybe he was having a good day. Maybe he was just thankful for Anne's ease and cooperation. Either way, Henry allowed this request, and from then on, Elizabeth would be a frequent guest at Richmond. It's clear to say that at this point in his life, King Henry VIII is probably the happiest he has been since his son Edward's birth. He has just had the easiest divorce in his life from Anne of Cleves, who he gave the honorary title of the King's sister, and he was passionately in love with young Catherine Howard. Henry divorced Anna Cleves on the 12th of July 1540 and he was married to Catherine Howard on the 28th of July. Honestly, that's not the quickest turnaround that Henry's done with his marriage. The couple were married at Oatlands Palace and to celebrate the nuptials, Henry had his former right-hand man, Thomas Cromwell, executed on Tower Hill. Ever the romantic, Henry. For ten days, the marriage was kept a secret as Henry wished to spend alone time with his wife before court resumed and the two would lack privacy. Henry was overjoyed with his young bride and was determined to lose weight. He got up at 6am, went to church and then went hunting. Whether Catherine felt the same, we don't know. However, she appeared cheerful and loving towards her husband and was lavish with more jewels than she could ever imagine. So I'm sure she was fine. The marriage meant that the Howards were back in the king's inner circle and were once again a powerhouse at court, like they were during the reign of Anne Boleyn. However, Henry now would become ruthless in eradicating religious opposition and heresy, and the latter years of his reign would be a dangerous time for English Protestants. Despite the country supposedly being Protestant under the Church of England, but I think it's important to remember that Henry himself was never a Protestant. He remained a Catholic. At a push, he was like an Anglo-Catholic, like his daughter Elizabeth would be, 
but he always remained a Catholic. On the 6th of August 1540, Henry and Catherine left Oatlands Palace and moved to Hampton Court. From here, Henry rode alone with a few attendants to visit Anne of Cleves. French ambassador Marillac wrote that they were on the best possible terms. It was thought by some that the king might restore her to her place as queen, and there were some who supported this view, but much to their dismay, this would never be the case. The purpose of the visit was for Anne to sign deeds of separation. The marriage was finally made public on the 8th of August, 1540 at Hampton Court Palace, when Catherine made her first appearance as queen. Catherine was kind and did her best to use her influence to help people, and she had a bright personality, a far cry from her arrogant cousin. She loved the importance that the role of queen gave her. Henry doted on Catherine, and as mentioned before, showered her in jewels, but also gowns. She had everything she could ever want. And unsurprisingly, it all went to her head. Although we don't know Catherine's exact year of birth, she was only a teenager when she was queen, so it's hardly unexpected. As a result, many of the older people at court disapproved of her and her greed. This included her eldest stepdaughter, the Lady Mary. Despite the two sharing the same faith, Mary did not show her new stepmother the same respect that she did for Jane Seymour and Anna Cleves. It could have been down to greed, or it could have been because she was potentially nine years older than her stepmother. Again, this is difficult to pinpoint due to not knowing Catherine's exact age. But either way, Mary was older than her stepmother. But to what extent? And Mary was still unmarried at the age of 24. Pretty late for Tudor society especially that of a princess. In the October, Henry passed the Queen Consort Act, which gave her power to act as a woman soul without the consent of the King's Highness. And, to top it all off, he then gave Catherine all the lands and manors that had once been in the possession of Queen Jane, all as a mark of love to his wife and queen. And I think the fact that Catherine is inheriting a lot of Jane Seymour's possessions really goes to show how much Henry was in love with Catherine Howard, as Jane was his favourite wife, so they would have been the most dear to him. When Jane died, even during his marriage to his sixth wife, Henry was painted with Jane in his family portrait, and he's eventually buried with Jane too. The queen that he saw as his one true wife and queen. I do wonder, had Henry and Catherine's marriage not gone the way that it did, would it be Catherine Howard in these paintings? Would he be buried with her instead? As he seems to genuinely be infatuated by her. Let me know what you think. Henry and Catherine spent Christmas and New Year's at Hampton Court Palace. And as you could probably guess, the celebrations were lavish. He gave her a ridiculous amount of jewels and furs. Unsurprisingly, Henry's spending on his wife had made the treasury broke. The gems that were in Catherine's presence were recycled gems that had belonged to his previous wives and he could not afford a coronation for Catherine. But, like Jane, he may have delayed the coronation until Catherine had proved herself with an heir. For the first few months of their marriage, Henry had visited Catherine's bed almost every night, but she never did conceive. However, I believe this was more down to Henry's age and infirmity than Catherine. The ladies Mary and Anne joined the king and queen on the 3rd of January 1541 at Hampton Court. Mary still didn't like her stepmother Catherine, but she enjoyed the company of her friend and former stepmother Anna Cleves, and Anne got on with everyone, so she helped smooth everything out. That evening, the king went to bed early while the women stayed up, and Anne of Cleves danced with the new queen. Henry then gave Catherine yet more presents, this time two dogs and a ring. Now, I can't tell if this is a snub or a kind gesture. But Catherine gave these presents to Anne of Cleves. Anne had given the royal couple two horses with violet velvet trappings prior to her arrival at Hampton Court. At the end of 1541, Marillac, the French ambassador, observed that the king was marvellously excessive in eating and drinking, and that 
People say he is often of a different opinion in the morning than after dinner. Henry was suffering from another bout of ill health. His leg was causing him extreme pain and he had sunk into a deep depression. Catherine, as of yet, had not seen this side to her husband and she could not arouse him from his depression. He refused to rise even for her. Catherine was alarmed by his behaviour, but by the 19th of March, he was fine again. Also, Henry was becoming paranoid in his old age. In the spring, there was an uprising in Yorkshire, headed by Sir John Neville, a Catholic, and the purpose was to restore the old forms of religion in England. When I say old forms, I mean like old forms of worship, stuff like that. Henry became paranoid and feared that this would lead to plots to put the Plantagenets back on the throne. His mother's family, the Yorks, which you can learn about in my video about King Henry VII. He had imprisoned 68-year-old Margaret Pole, Countess of Salisbury in the Tower of London, as far back as February, for this reason. Margaret was the daughter of George, Duke of Clarence, the uncle to Henry's mother, Elizabeth of York which meant that she had a claim to the throne and was a Plantagenet, a Tudor enemy. Margaret was harmless though, and she never sought Henry's throne. She had been loyal and devoted to the Tudor family. However, with a rebellion on his hands, Henry had decided that the Countess of Salisbury was a threat. It wasn't Margaret that Henry had an issue with. It was her estranged son, Cardinal Reginald Pole as he had been outspoken about the king. But as Henry couldn't reach Reginald, who was out of the country and being protected by the Pope, he turned to his mother instead. Catherine pleaded with Henry to spare the pensioner's life, but he ordered that a death sentence be provided. An act of attainder was passed against Lady Salisbury. Margaret Pole, Countess of Salisbury, was executed on Tower Green on the 28th of May, 1541, at the age of 68. The executioner was young and inexperienced and he panicked and struck out blindly, hacking at his victim's head, neck and shoulders. The cruel end of Lady Salisbury sickened even Henry's contemporaries, but he didn't care. The uprising in Yorkshire was speedily put down with the execution of its leaders. In response to the uprising on the 30th of July, 1541, Catherine and Henry left London for their Northern Progress Tour, in hopes of inspiring loyalty to his Northern subjects. And yet again, he gave Catherine more gifts. This time he gave her a golden brooch, an ideal gift, he said, for a perfect wife of virtue and good behaviour. However, Catherine's early life was about to come and bite her. It's too much to explain right now, and I made a separate video on it. But the TLDR was Catherine was not a virgin when she married the king, like he thought she was. A Protestant called John Lassells spoke to Archbishop Cranmer and told him that his sister Mary had been living with Catherine at the Dowager Duchess of Norfolk's house in Lambeth and that she had information that would affect the king's marriage. When Cranmer asked him why it took so long to disclose, Lassells said he'd been wrestling with his conscience. Cranmer had nothing against Catherine, but he wanted a Protestant queen to push Protestant reforms and spoke to Lassell's sister Mary to find out more on the queen's past. Mary Hall, Lassell's sister, told Cranmer all about Catherine's activities with her music teacher, Henry Mannix, and then Francis Derham, the latter of whom would creep often into Catherine's bed. In the August, Francis Derham was appointed as Catherine's private secretary. Francis had a fiery temper and was over-familiar with his royal mistress. Many felt that he was getting preferential treatment and they disliked him. Catherine had employed him because he held information that could endanger her position as queen. Catherine warned Derham to take heed with what words you speak. When Henry asked his wife why she had employed the unpopular Francis Derham, she told him that the Dowager Duchess of Norfolk had asked her to, to be good to him, and so I will. Henry's sister Margaret, former Queen of Scotland, died on the 8th of October 1541. Her death meant that, out of Henry's siblings, he was the last one left, as his younger sister Mary had died in 1533. Catherine and Henry returned to Hampton Court Palace on the 30th of October 1541 
and a special service of thanksgiving took place on the 1st of November. Now, for those of you in America, this is not a thanksgiving service as you might think of it. After all, America and its forefathers weren't a thing yet. This service was to give thanks for the king's marriage to Catherine and to bless his marriage to his wife. On that day, he publicly thanked God in the Chapel Royal for blessing him for so perfect a companion. I render thanks to thee, O Lord, that after so many strange accidents that have befallen my marriage, thou hast been pleased to give me a wife so entirely confirmed to my inclinations as her I have now. Meanwhile, Cranmer had written the king a letter with all the information he had found out about the Queen's past, and left it on a chair for the king to find. Henry read the note that Cranmer had left him, and he did not believe the accusations. However, he did ask Cranmer to investigate the matter. You are not to desist until you have got to the bottom of the plot. He then ordered for the Queen and Jane Boleyn, Lady Rochford, to be confined to the Queen's apartments until their names were cleared. Henry stayed away and would never see his Queen again. Catherine and her ladies were practising dancing when the King's guards came to arrest her. Catherine, who had more pressing things on her mind than her romps with Mannix and Durham years ago, demanded to know why she had been confined. But the guards would not enlighten her. Catherine had a hunch, and in the days to come, the knowledge prevented her from eating and sleeping. On the 5th of November 1541, Cranmer and the council told the king that they believed the allegations against the queen had a sound basis. Cranmer actually didn't have any evidence beyond his own logic and that of the lassels. Henry slumped into his chair, heartbroken, and wouldn't speak. Then he cried in front of the council. When Henry initially found out about Durham and Mannox, he calmed down after the initial rage and seemed to be tempted to be merciful. But it was Culpepper that was the final straw, as Catherine's antics with Culpepper had happened during their marriage. Foolishly, Catherine had written what seemed like love letters and sent him gifts. And worse still, with the help of her Lady Rochford, Catherine had allowed Culpepper into her bedchamber while on the northern tour of her husband. Her uncle, the Duke of Norfolk, was the only family member present when Catherine was informed of her charges and witnessed her hysterical reaction. Norfolk told Marillac that she was weeping like a madwoman so that they must take away things by which she might hasten her death. Lady Rochford, who was guilty in abetting the Queen, suffered a bout of madness. It was thought by many that the two women would suffer the same fate as they were confined together. Before Henry left Hampton Court, Catherine dashed past the guards and tried to reach him while he was at prayer in the Chapel Royal, but she was caught and dragged screaming back to her rooms. This corridor is known as the Haunted Gallery and it is rumoured that Catherine's ghost reenacts her capture in that corridor. Cranmer visited Catherine Howard in her apartment in hopes of getting a confession from her, the once bright and cheery Catherine was melancholy and had moments of friendliness. It was clear that Catherine was not in the right state to be interrogated, so Cranmer came back the next day, but she was still quite frenzied. Cranmer was shaken by her behaviour and feared for her sanity. He read a letter from the king that promised her mercy if she confessed her faults. Catherine, under the impression that Henry was trying to deal with her gently, calmed. She then thanked the king for his grace and mercy and became more temperate and moderate, even though she did not stop crying and when her panic hit her once more, she started to scream. Catherine insisted that she did not consent to her actions with Derham. When Catherine and Derham had been interacting back at the Dowager Duchess of Norfolk's house, they referred to each other as husband and wife, something that should only be done if you intend to marry each other and therefore the two would have been seen as pre-contracted to each other. Catherine denied this to Cranmer and claimed it was common gossip, but she was too naive to realise that by admitting to the pre-contract with Derham, her life might have been spared, as lawfully she would never have been the king's wife 
and therefore she could not be accused of adultery, the very thing that Cranmer was trying to prove. Catherine divulged to Cranmer her interactions with Derham and how he half lain with me sometimes in his doublet and hose and two or three times naked. Catherine then mentioned how Derham had heard a rumour that she was going to marry her cousin, Thomas Culpepper. When asked if it was true, she denied it, saying, What should you trouble me thereabouts? For you know I will not have you. And if you heard such report, you know more than I. Catherine's big mistake was mentioning Culpepper. Culpepper was at court and a gentleman in the king's privy chamber. Catherine had always been fond of Culpepper. Cranmer did not know of this, but he was suspicious, and so he convinced the council to arrest and detain Culpepper for questioning. On the 7th of November 1541, Cranmer sent the Queen's written confession to the King, along with a further statement alleging that Derham had forced himself on Catherine. Catherine then also wrote a separate plea. Henry read the plea and was cheered because his beloved wife had not been unfaithful to him and Mannix and Derham had occurred prior to the marriage. Henry was informed of the pre-contract and was fine with an annulment. Henry returned to Hampton Court Palace and he socialised with the ladies. Marillac of the French ambassador noted on how happy he looked. Rumours spread that Henry would take back Anne of Cleves, which King Francis I was in support of, as he had allied himself with the German princes and had hoped to create support against the Spanish emperor. However, Cranmer had not yet questioned Derham or Culpepper. The Queen was instructed to leave all of her lavish clothes and jewels at Hampton Court and she was escorted to Sion Abbey, which had just been vacated by Lady Margaret Douglas. Catherine's lady, Catherine Tilney, was questioned next. Tilney told how, while on the Northern Progress, the Queen would frequently go to Lady Rochford's room and Tilney would have to carry messages from the Queen to Lady Rochford that were so strange that she could not tell how to utter them. The council then summoned Margaret Morton, another of the Queen's ladies, to corroborate Tilney's story. Which it did, but Margaret dropped in the name, Thomas Culpepper. With Culpepper's name arising twice now, the council searched his belongings and they found a badly spelt letter signed from the Queen. I mean, don't forget, Catherine didn't have a great education. She was actually barely literate. It said, Master Culpepper, I heartily recommend me unto you, praying you to send me word how that you do. I did hear that ye were sick, and I never longed for anything so much as to see you. It maketh me heart to die, when I do think, and I cannot always be in your company. Come to me when Lady Rochford be here, for then I shall be best at leisure to be at your commandment, and thus I take my leave of you, trusting to see you shortly again, and I would you were with me now, that you might see what pain I take in writing to you, yours as long as life endures, Catherine. Catherine's letter was the most damning evidence against her, and it supported the accounts of both Morton and Tilney. Lady Rochford was then interrogated, followed by Culpepper. The Duke of Norfolk had abandoned his niece at the slightest bit of trouble and told Marillac that she had prostituted herself to seven or eight persons. Norfolk was publicly shaming his niece to distance himself from her, just in case anyone remembered that it was his idea to try and set her up with the king. Henry now knew the worst, that Catherine had cheated on him with Culpepper. Despite the heartbreak, he took the news calmly. Catherine was stripped of her title of Queen in the late November of 1541. I want to say around the 23rd. I have in my notes the 22nd, but I've also got the 24th written down. And then when I've checked online, they've also said the 23rd. So it was either the 22nd, 23rd or 24th. Culpepper and Durham were tried by the Privy Council on the 1st of December. They were tried together and then later executed together on the 10th of December, 1541. Culpepper was first. No block was provided. He knelt on the ground by the gallows. Derham was hung, drawn and quartered, and both men 
had their heads set upon spikes on London Bridge. Marillac, the French ambassador, wrote to King Francis I prior to their execution and said he thought that Culpepper deserved to die. He noted that it seemed that the king would not be merciful for his wife as he had changed his love for the queen into hatred and taken such grief at being deceived that of late it was thought he'd gone mad. On one occasion, the king had called for a sword to slay her he had loved so much and that sometimes he would say he would have delight in her death. Members of the Howard family were arrested in the middle of December and taken to the Tower of London. The Duke of Norfolk wrote to the king, pleading to save his own skin, and abandoned his family going as far to say that he was sure that the arrests were justified, but after the abominable deeds done by my two nieces, here he's referring to Anne Boleyn and Catherine Howard, I fear your majesty will be abhorrent to hear speak of me or my kin again. Henry was angry with all of the Howards, especially the Duke of Norfolk, and he had not forgotten how it was he that pushed for the relationships with both Anne and Catherine. Both Catherine Howard and Jane, Lady Rochford, had shown signs of insanity while in the Tower, although... Jane had it much worse than Catherine. On the 7th of February 1542, Henry passed a bill of attainter against both of the women, and he changed the law. It had once been illegal to execute the insane. Henry had changed the law prior to Catherine and Jane's execution, so he could execute them. Unlike George and Anne Boleyn, Catherine and Jane were denied a trial. Catherine learnt of her fate on the 10th of February 1542, while at Sion Abbey, the calm she had been exerting turned into blind panic, realising that Henry intended to have her executed. She refused to go, but she was forced into a barge that would take her to the Tower of London, all the while shrieking. Fortunately, her barge was enclosed, so she didn't see the rotting heads of Durham and Culpepper that were still on Tower Bridge. Catherine was wearing a black velvet dress, and sat with four of her ladies and four members of the Privy Council. Catherine was told of her execution date on the 12th of February 1542, so she asked for a block to be brought to her room as she was concerned about making a good impression and wanted to look dignified. The strange request was granted and she spent the night practising how to lay her head on the block. The next day, Catherine was taken to Tower Green She appeared weak to the point that she could hardly stand or speak. She asked, All Christian people to take regard unto her worthy and just punishment with death, for her offences against God, heinously from her youth upward in breaking of all his commandments, and also against the king's royal majesty very dangerously. Her head was severed with one blow. Lady Rochford was next. According to Chapuis, She was still in a frenzy, yet when faced with the axe and the queen's blood-soaked remains being wrapped in a black blanket, she pulled herself together enough to make a speech. Then she too was gone. Catherine's remains were put in the chapel of St Peter ad Vincula near her cousin Anne Boleyn. Catherine had been stripped of her title as queen, but her and Henry's marriage had never been annulled, and so... Henry became a widower on the 13th of February, 1542. Wait a tick. That means I'm single again. Oh, behave! (laughs) Yeah! Henry was in no rush for another wife, and he firmly told the Duke of Cleves that a reconciliation between him and Anne would never happen. Instead, he focused on marriages for his children. Elizabeth was badly affected by Catherine's death. She seemed to have got on with her stepmother, unlike her sister, and reportedly stated there and then that she would never marry. It's understandable when you look at marriage through her eyes. So far in her life, marriage seems to be associated with death. Mary, on the other hand, hardly flinched at the news. After all, she'd already seen her father behead a stepmother, and she didn't like that one either. Now, if you thought that Henry's reputation had hindered him finding a wife after the death of Jane Seymour. Well, 
that's nothing after the execution of his fifth wife, Catherine Howard. With Jane, there were still plenty of noble women within England willing to be Henry's bride. It was the other royal families that were concerned. But now even the women within England were weary of King Henry and his reputation. Most ladies saw queenship as something not to be taken lightly, as the king either putteth away or killeth his wives. The next queen would have to have nerves of steel. Relations between the English and the Scottish had been tense, and the death of his sister Margaret, Scotland's former queen, did not help matters. Henry had reached out to Scotland to try and arrange a treaty of friendship. He did not want another repeat of the Battle of Flodden, but his Scottish counterpart had snubbed him at every opportunity. Henry had arranged for King James V of Scotland to meet him in York in the middle of September 1541. But King James did not trust his uncle. Henry was left waiting for five days, and James never showed. So Henry went back to Windsor. Henry was furious that his nephew, King James V of Scotland, had rejected his friendship and alliance and commanded an attack on the 24th of November 1542. This battle became the Battle of Solway Moss. The English won this battle, so let's talk about it. The Scottish were destroyed by the English, mainly because, in my personal opinion, that they had bad leadership and they didn't see our attack coming. The victory at Solway Moss was the first time that Henry had shown some happiness since the death of Catherine Howard. King James, on the other hand, took to his bed at Falklands Palace. He was informed that his wife, Mary of Guise, had just given birth to a daughter, Mary, and James died on the 14th of December, leaving the infant Mary as Mary, Queen of Scots. Henry was thrilled. This meant that Scotland was no longer a threat, and he planned to arrange a marriage between his son, the Prince Edward, and the new Queen of Scots. On the 1st of January 1543, Prince Edward performed his first public duty at the age of five. He entertained a party of Scottish nobles who had been captured at Solway Moss. He was praised for being well-mannered and Henry had found another woman who he would like to be his wife. She was virtuous and attractive. As usual, Henry showered her with gifts to signify his interest, although not to the extent that he did with Catherine Howard. The issue with this woman was that she was married to Lord Latimer, who was very ill. Henry was certain that once Lord Latimer had passed, his widow would be thrilled at being Queen of England, and this woman in question was Catherine Parr. I can tell you now, Catherine felt the opposite. Lord Latimer finally died on the 2nd of March 1543, leaving Catherine a free woman and ready to marry, although Henry did wait out of respect for Lord Latimer and his passing. Catherine remained at court after her husband's death, but it wasn't for the king. It was for a man that she actually wanted to marry. Sir Thomas Seymour, the brother of the late Queen Jane, Thomas was six years older than Catherine. She saw him as handsome and ambitious, and he saw her as a rich, attractive widow that could increase his own fortune. The two had spent some time together after Lord Latimer's death, and the topic of marriage had even reared its head. A scandal hit the Parr family. Catherine's brother, William Parr, had applied for a divorce from his wife, Anne Beauchere, as she had eloped with her lover in 1542. Anne was the heiress of the last Earl of Essex and the Borshire line. William was so hurt at his wife's adultery that he was pressing the king for the death penalty. Catherine refused to stand by her brother and she went straight to the king to beg him not to execute her sister-in-law, who had been a part of the Parr family since 1526. Catherine threw herself to the floor at the king's feet and refused to rise until the king had promised to spare Lady Parr from the headman's axe. 
Madam, you know that the law enacts that a woman of rank who forgets herself shall die unless her husband pardon her. Your Majesty is above the law, and I will try to get my brother to pardon her. If your brother can be content, I will pardon her. Catherine spoke to her brother, who had known of the king's interest in her, and forgave his wife. The king rewarded him for his clemency. However, Catherine was blissfully unaware of the king's interest in her, as she had her eyes on Thomas Seymour. Catherine didn't want to be queen, she wanted to be with Thomas. The king knew that while Thomas was around, Catherine would not be his, so he sent Thomas Seymour to the court of the region of the Netherlands in Brussels, permanently. With Thomas out of sight, out of mind, he continued his pursuit of Catherine. Negotiations for a marriage between Prince Edward and Mary, Queen of Scots, was agreed, and the Treaty of Greenwich was signed on the 1st of July, 1543. It was at this time that Henry proposed to Catherine Parr. Henry was not Thomas, but she accepted his unwelcomed advances. Catherine, despite not having children of her own, had experience in her past that would help her be the wife that survived. She was not a giddy girl, like Catherine Howard. Her first husband had been an old man, and she had nursed Lord Latimer, her second husband, during the last part of his life. She was sensible, and she had been a stepmother before. Catherine Parr and Henry VIII were wed at the Chapel Royal in Hampton Court Palace. The Lady Margaret Douglas, niece of Henry's, was chief bridesmaid. Lady Anne of Cleves was also in attendance and seemed very pleased for her ex-husband. Catherine was pretty, warm and intelligent, and most importantly for Archbishop Cranmer, a Protestant, which had been his main issue with her predecessor, Catherine Howard. Cranmer and the other reformists hoped that Catherine could influence the king in the Protestant ways. We will watch your career with great interest. Catherine had written and published two books that promote her religious views, and indeed is evidence of her intellect. This was the first time a Queen of England had ever shared their personal views with her subjects, and of course, she was very flattering of the king in her publication, calling him my most sovereign, favourable lord and husband. The king took his bride to Windsor, and to celebrate the marriage, burnt three Protestant heretics to death in the Great Park. I'm not saying I wasn't a little surprised. At first, I was like, ah! But now that I've had time to absorb it, I'm fine. Bishop Gardner, who had suspected the Queen as being a Lutheran, watched her closely. But she didn't flinch, nor did she intercede. In August 1543, with the King's permission, Catherine invited her stepchildren to come to court, as all three of them lived far away and rarely saw their father. Catherine wanted to provide a stable domestic life, which had been lacking truly from all of their lives. The Lady Elizabeth thanked Catherine for her kindness and promised to conduct herself in a way that Catherine would never have cause for complaint. Elizabeth was now ten and very precocious and intelligent. Catherine took a shine to Elizabeth and supervised her education. Henry was impressed with Catherine and would later ask for her advice when it came to Edward's education. The Lady Mary became friends with her stepmother as they were of similar ages. They found much in common and Mary enjoyed being back at court. Edward did not visit as often as Henry was scared that Edward may catch a disease, but Edward too loved his stepmother as much as he could. The Treaty of Greenwich was rejected by the Scottish Parliament in 1543 and it was implied that the Prince and future King of England was not good enough for the Queen of Scots. Say what? Henry retaliated by sending an army to set fire to Leith, Edinburgh and Holyrood, which included the Abbey where James V was buried. Henry's army left a trail of destruction along the Scottish border. <sighs> Boy, that escalated quickly. I mean, that really got out of hand fast. This was the start of the rough wooing, an eight-year war between England and Scotland, where Henry is trying to convince Scotland of a union between the two children through fighting. Not a great plan. If it was me and I was trying to convince someone to marry me, I think I would have sent them flowers, chocolate and some gems. 
Then Ray, if that's what you want to do, crack on, mate, see how well it works out. The Tudors spent Christmas together as a family that year, and on the 7th of February 1544, Henry passed a new act of succession, which stated that any child he and Catherine have will go after Prince Edward. Then any children that Henry may have with other queens, and then the Lady Mary, and then the Lady Elizabeth. It was Catherine who had urged Henry to put Mary as his heir after Edward. Henry announced on the 7th of July 1544 that Catherine Parr would be regent while he was away in France. Parr was only the second of Henry's six wives to have received the honour of regent, and the first being Catherine of Aragon when she had won the Battle of Flodden in 1513. Catherine Parr accompanied her husband to port on the 14th of July and kissed her husband goodbye. She then led the whole country in prayer, which she had written herself. Catherine wrote to Henry often. Prior to going to France, Henry and Elizabeth had fallen out again, and she was forbade to going to court. Catherine had begged Henry to forgive Elizabeth prior to leaving, but he refused. Elizabeth thanked Catherine for her help. Elizabeth said that she had not written to her father and asked Catherine to try again on her behalf. I guess it's true that absence makes the heart grow fonder. And Henry conceded and allowed Elizabeth to join Catherine and Mary at Greenwich Palace so she could keep her new stepmother company. Despite all this, I couldn't find any evidence to actually suggest what had caused the falling out. On the 14th of September 1544, Boulogne fell to England and King Francis I was forced to sign a peace treaty. Chapuis, the Spanish ambassador, wrote, I never in my life saw the king so joyful and in such good spirits and so elated. Catherine Parr ordered a general thanksgiving to be offered throughout the country for the king's victory in France and Henry returned to Dover on the 30th of September. Henry, at this point, had been consistently loving and kind to Catherine and the two openly showed affection to each other upon his return. Sir Thomas Seymour returned to England in the October. Henry was worried of a scandal, but Catherine hid her true feelings and treated Thomas no differently to anyone else. In March 1545, Henry came down with a fever and this did not help his temperament. Heretics were popping up all over the country and so Henry had 23 people arrested and executed at this time. One of them was Anne Askew. Eustace Chapuy, the Spanish ambassador, informed the king in the May that he would be returning to Spain for his health. Chapuy had been at the English court since 1529. Henry was sad to see him go. Henry would have more sadness when his best friend and former brother-in-law, Charles Brandon, Duke of Suffolk, died on the 22nd of August, 1545. Charles's eldest son, Henry, aged 10, went to the household of Prince Edward, who was seven. Bishop Gardiner, amongst others, thought the Queen was sympathetic to Protestant heretics. Catherine spent her time with the Seymour brothers, Thomas and Edward, the widowed Duchess of Suffolk, Lady Hartford and Lady Dudley. The women were in the Queen's household and it was thought that these people were influencing the Queen and thus the King with their Protestant views. Catherine published her two books, the first one being... <coughs> Prayers and their meditations wherein the mind is stirred patiently to suffer all inflictions her, to set a naught the vain prosperity of this world, and always to long for the everlasting felicity collected out of holy works by the most virtuous and gracious Princess Catherine, Queen of England. <gasps> My God, Catherine, could you have not chosen a shorter title? And her second book, The Lamentations of a Sinner. These two books probably did not help dispel the concerns around her religion. By 1546, Henry's affections for Catherine were starting to cool. She had not been pregnant in the three years that they had been married, and he was jealous for the recognition that she was receiving for her intellect. Bishop Gardiner had noted that the Queen was correct the King, and he was becoming less and less tolerable of such things. He stopped making daily visits to her apartments, and it was up to her to see him. One day, Henry rudely cut the Queen short and changed the subject. Catherine was stunned, as it was out of character for him. He then went back to his old self and said, Farewell, sweetheart. The Bishop Gardiner had been listening, 
and he had managed to convince the king that his wife was in the centre of a Protestant conspiracy. Gardner was charged with finding evidence and he questions three of her favourite ladies-in-waiting, Lady Herbert, Catherine's sister, Lady Lane and Lady Tyrit. He asked if the Queen kept forbidden reading materials that may promote heresy and their coffers were searched. Henry made it known that he was agreeable to a warrant being drawn up for the Queen's arrest if there is suspicion of heresy. You mean, if he finds out? Of course he's going to find... If. If is good. Catherine was none the wiser and continued to engage the king in religious debates. Henry allowed it as he was listening carefully to every word that she said. The arrest warrant was drawn up and Henry signed it. A member of the Privy Council dropped it and a loyal servant, Catherine, found it and brought it to her. Catherine was hysterical. Henry had proved twice that he was not above executing a wife and queen, and if she was arrested on charges of heresy, her fate would be worse than that of Anne Boleyn and Catherine Howard. She would most likely be burnt at the stake. Catherine took to her bed crying so loudly that the king heard. Not knowing what was the matter, Henry sent his doctor, Dr Wendy, who had replaced Dr Butts in 1545. Dr Wendy figured out that Catherine knew what the king had planned and warned her about Bishop Gardiner, who was plotting her downfall. This did nothing to calm her. Eventually, the king, learning of her state of mind, went to see her himself. Catherine calmed at the sight of him and managed to say that she was scared that he had become displeased with her. Henry could tell that Catherine was being sincere. He stayed with her for an hour, and when he had gone, Catherine made all of her ladies get rid of all forbidden books. She would no longer interfere with religion. Later that evening, Catherine, with her sister and Lady Lane, visited the king in his chambers. He welcomed her, and he eventually brought up the subject of religion. Catherine told her husband that if she had ever differed with him on religion, it was only to educate herself, and because she wanted to help pass away the pain and weariness of your present infirmity, which encouraged me in this boldness, in hope of profiting with all by your majesty's learned discourse. Henry was a little relieved at this and told her that, if that was the case, then we are perfect friends again. They embraced and he kissed her. He promised never to doubt her again. I do wonder if Catherine Howard, or even Anne Boleyn, had had the same opportunity to explain themselves if they would have got lighter sentences. Let me know what you think. Thomas Risley, who had been working with Bishop Gardner throughout, had not known of the royal couple's reconciliation the night before. He marched up to the Queen, who was taking in the air with the King in Whitehall Palace Gardens. With 40 of the King's guards at his heels, he had the intent of escorting the Queen to the Tower of London with her three ladies, who were also present. Thomas was obviously confused. The king looked at him sternly. Thomas fell to his knees and began to explain why he was there, but the king just shouted at him, Knave! Arrant knave! Beast! Fool! and then ordered him out of his sight. Catherine knew why he was there, and it had been a very lucky escape. 24th of August, 1546, the royal couple visited the court of King Francis I to sign a new peace treaty between England and France. They then went on progress over the English-ruled areas of France. Henry's health was noticeably failing. His leg was worse than ever, and he needed a mechanical hoist to get him up and down stairs. Henry also had two chairs called trams that he would sit in and be carried to and from in his galleries and chambers. Although no one spoke of the king's death as it was illegal, everyone knew it was coming, and so turned their attentions on Prince Edward. His thoughts also turned to his son, and he sent him gifts from chains to rings and jewelled buttons. In the December, the Duke of Norfolk reared his ugly head yet again and tried to get rid of the queen, and this time to replace her, not with his niece, I guess he ran out of them, but with his own daughter and the king's daughter-in-law, 
Mary Howard, the Duchess of Richmond. The plot was devised by her father, the Duke of Norfolk, and her brother, the Earl of Surrey. Unfortunately for Norfolk, the third time was not the charm. The plot was found out, and when Mary was questioned, she incriminated both her father and brother. The Earl of Surrey and the Duke of Norfolk were arrested on the charge of high treason and taken to the Tower of London. Henry had not trusted Norfolk since the demise of Catherine Howard and was not in the mood to show him mercy. Mary's brother, Henry Howard, the Earl of Surrey, was executed on Tower Hill on the 19th of January 1547. Norfolk, however, remained in the Tower, waiting for the King's decision. And I've got to say, you'll find out later, Norfolk literally got away by the skin of his teeth. On the 30th of December 1546, Henry dictated his will, which left England to Prince Edward, and the line of succession remained pretty much the same. Edward, then any babies from Henry and Catherine, in case she happened to be pregnant and the baby was born after he died, Mary and her heirs, Elizabeth and her heirs. Then it should go to the heirs of his eldest sister, Margaret Tudor, which is the Scottish royal family, Mary Queen of Scots and her heirs. But instead, Henry changes it so after Elizabeth and her heirs, it goes to the heirs of his late sister, Mary, Duchess of Suffolk. Henry was adamant that Queen Mary of Scotland should never rule England unless it is as Edward's consort. On the 23rd of January 1547, it was announced who would be on Edward's Regency Council. Edward's uncle, Earl of Hertford, later Duke of Somerset, was to be Lord Protector, assisted by Thomas Cranmer and John Dudley were some of the top names. On the 26th of January, Henry could feel that he didn't have long left. He said his goodbyes to Catherine and gave her his blessing to remarry after his death. Catherine cried. The next day he saw his daughter Mary, who was 31 at this point, and made her promise to look after her little brother Edward. Mary was in tears and begged him not to die so soon. The king said farewell and dismissed her. The death warrant for Norfolk was drawn up, but Henry was too ill to sign it, and as a result Norfolk would have six more years in the tower before being released to serve another Tudor monarch. King Henry VIII died on the 28th of January 1547 at the age of 55 at Whitehall Palace. Now the Queen Dowager, Catherine was informed immediately about his death, but it was not announced for another three days to help smooth the transition between monarchs. Catherine would not attend the funeral, but that was custom. King Edward VI was at Hertford Castle when his uncle, Lord Protector, arrived on the 30th of January. He took the young king to Enfield to see his sister Elizabeth, where the two children were informed of their father's passing. Edward was nine and Elizabeth was thirteen. They cried and they were not consolable. Edward was brought to London on the 31st of January, where he was then proclaimed king. On the 14th of January 1547, the body of the late king began its last journey, a coffin that was covered in a cloth of gold. Resting on the coffin was a wax effigy of the king, dressed in velvet adorned with precious stones. Banners were carried aloft in the procession, but only two of Henry's six wives were represented, Jane Seymour, Edward's mother, and Catherine Parr. Henry had not considered his other marriages worthy of commemoration. Which, I mean, poor Catherine of Aragon. Like, I feel like she deserved to be up there. Henry's funeral was on the 16th of February, 1547. Henry was laid to rest at Windsor Castle in St George's Chapel, next to Edward's mother, Jane Seymour. At the end of the service, the herald cried, Le Roy est mort, vive le Roy. The king is dead live the king. The young King Edward VI cried and he wrote in his diary, this consoles us that he is now in heaven and that he hath gone out of this miserable world into happy and everlasting blessedness. 
thank you for watching today's video i hope you enjoyed it if you did please support me any way you can it can be as little as subscribing liking or watching another but until the next video have a wonderful day